Welcome, welcome, everybody, to a late night gas mass and hand grenades. Well, it's late night for me, not as late night for you guys on the West Coast and the Mountain uh, Zones here. But hey, look who I've got here. Going on, man. We're kind of spread out everywhere tonight, so it's kind of cool. It's kind of a you know spanning the continent of guests so yes we do we've got this spanning the national continent of metal so we've got uh jimmy from future runes is joining me tonight and um of course i am jeff and this is gas mass and hand grenades and we welcome you all here that uh, are here for a pretty special night this is a pretty cool one how about it jim absolutely man uh especially for the fact that i've i sort of got like the halloween blues right now i don't know about you but like whenever halloween's over with uh you know for a few days i'm kind of like uh, a little depressed in a way but it's also good because i love the winter time so and we've already gotten the snow here so winter is good as well but uh yeah you know when october's over i'm a little uh you know a little depressed but you know i'm still i'm still, still wearing some monster halloween shirt, man you know? I'm still mm -hmm. repping i'm still trying to get over my hangover from saturday night from uh, right. the catacombs of depravity but hey let's move on let's get these guys in here real quick we want to welcome mr don anderson and mr john Holm from Agalock. Guys, how you doing? Good. Good. We'll go through that dance yeah. like we didn't chat already for a couple minutes, right? <laughs> but John, it's it's great to have you here. Don is a victim of gas masks a couple of times. He's already been a, a kind of willing victim, I think. I think, right, Don? It's willing. I haven't actually had to tie you up and drag you in here. So, But uh, it's very cool to have you guys here. And um, we're here to talk about some cool stuff that's going on uh, with the Agalot camp. Uh, you guys were away for quite a long time and you are back with a vengeance. You got a lot going on for, you know, wrapping the year end up here. You've had some pretty high, you got one more high profile gig to go, I believe. Right. And you did a really high profile gig a couple of weeks ago over in Germany that we're going to talk about. And then a big one just a couple of weeks ago in your hometown of, of Portland. So um, welcome to the show guys. Let me kind of get into it here. Uh, I was, John, I was actually asking Don about snow out there. I was assuming that you guys would have snow, but you guys are pretty temperate because you're by the ocean, right? Sort of. Yeah. In fact, today, I think it was around 70. It's kind oh, of really? Like, it's it's really warmer day to day. Yeah. 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 It's stormy. Yeah. We're down in the, I told Don we're at 30, 30 tonight. It's the first night it's actually going below the freezing line and, uh, I ran the trash out early. It was pretty nippy out. So, I mean, I kind of like Jimmy. I kind of like this time of the year, too. It's it's um, it's just fun. And, John, I saw on your Instagram you were carving pumpkins, having fun with the Halloween spirit. Uh, yeah, my uh, girlfriend has never carved a pumpkin. She's from Serbia. so No way. Yeah, yeah. So I had to introduce her to that. <laughs> That's awesome, man. I haven't carved a pumpkin in many, many years. And it's funny because after – like the day after, I thought, oh, man, I should have made a Corgol pumpkin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but oh, well. Speaking of that, I don't know. Do you guys, you guys know Blood Incantation? You know the dudes, right? I'm yeah. assuming, right. So Morris, did you see Morris, what he did? He had an Aphex twin pumpkin. I thought, man, nobody's going to top that. That is, that's so ripping cool, right? So um, let's get into this, guys, because I don't want to keep you here all night. So, again, welcome uh to gas mass and hangar needs uh let's kind of talk about and i i, I do want to both jim and i discuss this you guys were, had a cover story in decibel that i believe is out right now out this month correct yeah i do not have it i've not grabbed it yet i'm not a subscriber i usually go you know issues that i'm interested in and neither one of us have seen it so i apologize if a few of these questions are a little bit of overlap i hope they're not i don't think they are except yes. this one the obvious one from your perspective, I want to hear from the horse's mouth. What happened here? Why now? What what is the reason that we've been bestowed this gift of Agalock again? So I'm going to switch our layout up so I can blow you guys up a little better here, if you don't mind. 
And I, I should be more professional here, but I'm not. I apologize. There we go. All right. John, how about I start with you? Do you mind? Okay. So tell me a little bit about why Agaloc rebirth and what, what the, maybe what the ethos behind it was and the decisions to do it now and what led to all this stuff. And then I'll kind of get Don's perspective as well. Well, uh, about a year ago we were drinking and uh, it just kind of came up, you know, we, we, we missed playing live. We missed, you know, each of us missed playing big shows. I know I did. And we were we were drinking at this uh, at this place. We were at level level, I think. And uh, yeah, it just it just dropped out. I was just like, yeah, I'd play I'd play a show again. And I think Don nearly had a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that yeah, and so we just kind of it started off as sort of a yeah, we would do that maybe in the future and then it just kind of turned into us actually doing it following yeah. through right yeah yeah it, it took us a couple of tryouts with a drummer and you know with a previous drummer and then you know um finally with hunter but yeah it was it was a pretty easy transition and it was pretty cool to play the songs again i might i might add can, can you give me a, a feel for Timing wise, because Don, when I spoke to you in December of last year, I think it was early December or very late November. I can't remember exactly. But when we had our first interview following you kind of catching the, the the deep dive that we did, which I don't know if you happen to look at that or bothered to look at it, John might not be your thing to, to bother with that kind of stuff. But Jimmy and I and two other guys did an exhaustive like four and a half, five hour fucking deep dive on the band where we... I I'll, I'll, I'll admit something. I was working on the mantle book for the reissue. I was mm -hmm. working on the, on the design for it. And I saw that, that deep dive on YouTube. So I just put it on and listened to it while I was working on the mantle. Cause I like to work on stuff. I like to, I like to listen to, to Agaloc while I'm working on Agaloc stuff or work. Mm -hmm. or if, I'm, if I'm doing a design for another band, I like to listen to their, their music sure. it puts me in the headspace. So, yeah, I just kind of put that on because it's kind of, you know, it's interesting to hear what other people's perspectives of of our work is sometimes. Um, Was it way too masturbatory on our part or? At times. <laughs> you know, we're hey, very that's masturbatory what, with our music. <laughs> that, that's what we do. We do that shit, right? I mean, you know, you guys are masturbatory in your, your music. We were masturbatory in our praise. But, yeah, we, but I like we those... did that. And somehow along the line, Don, I think you caught it. And I... I will say, and I, I don't know if you probably won't remember, John, but I did actually reach out to you on, on Instagram and say, hey, man, just check this out. See what you think. <laughs> I know. I get it. It's cool. Yeah. You probably get tons and tons of DMs that you just have to disregard. It usually goes to my other inbox, and I don't ever, ever see it. Right, right. Yeah. But Don did see it, and Don did enjoy it. And Don and I kind of, you know, Don was my third interview. I had uh, Chewy <clears throat> from Voivod on first, and then I had Craig with Cisco, uh Cicero from Forbidden, my buddy from uh, uh, Craig on, and then I got Don on, and we had a, a really nice talk, and the whole point of this is to get to this point, and that is at that point in time, Don, I asked you, what are the chances of this happening, what we're talking about right now, and you kind of, if I recall correctly, I didn't go back and watch it. I don't watch myself that often, to be completely honest with you. Um, I, If I remember correctly, you were kind of like, never say never. We've had discussions we're all friends now that was the key thing that i took away was that you were all you had all linked back up as friends and that was the most important aspect of of all of it but now speak to it a little bit from your perspective um yeah well because i mean when we talked when we did our our interview we had probably kicked this idea around seriously maybe two different times and each of those two times we decided we weren't ready for it. Our hearts weren't in the right place. It, we were perfectly happy with our solo works. And, you know, I was already doing, wrapping up the sculptured liminal phase record. So we all felt, and, you know, John was very busy with his solo stuff. And so was Jason. So we all felt pretty fulfilled and we didn't feel like, oh, not yet. But we had two very serious discussions uh, about that possibility. And then as John explained, <clears throat> We were having, what's weird is when a band breaks up, 
it still exists in a number of ways. Business wise, there's sure. Still merch. There's still reissues. And so you do often have to get together and talk about things and go over things. So we would have Agalock meetings, even though the band was broken up. It was kind of strange. And John will tell you, I mean, he's been doing more graphic design post breakup than he did when we were together. Right. And so it's almost like so absurd that, yeah, I think that sort of influenced the idea of like, well, we should at least, you know, we're like, we're not doing the fun thing anymore. <laughs> you know, we're doing the, this kind of work. And so, yeah, right. so John sort of flippantly said, well, we should do a show. And I said, yeah, let's do it. Because me and Jason were, I think, ready before John was, at least emotionally and, and you know, psychologically ready to do it. And so we said, yeah, and so start thinking about a drummer. And one thing I said early on was, I was like, well, you know, let's just keep it the three of us. Let's treat it like that, you know, band photos, PR, that kind of thing. Keep it just the three of us, because that's how the Ag Aglock more or less started with the first couple records. Sure. And we'll have a session drummer. And we'll just keep it simple that way. And so I think that was nice. And we also could learn from things that didn't work, you know, mistakes we made. You know, we had this hindsight that was really valuable that not a lot of bands have. And now we had that. And so, but also the, I think the most important reason why we did this is because we didn't have to. Right. You know, and I think that's really the best reason to do anything is when it's not necessary. It's not a cash in. It's not, you know, we're not having midlife crises. We are perfectly happy with our own work individually. Um, we just miss playing the songs. And yeah, I miss playing big shows. I have a lot of, it's very cathartic for me and, and it's a wonderful release and it's great. Even today, I was reviewing some songs for the Denver show and it was just great to relearn some of the things we're doing for that gig. Um, and it's, it's nice to feel like a professional musician again, where you have gigs. Yeah. You know, Did you guys, you know, were you guys getting fielding any? You don't have any management, you guys are your own managers, I assume, or am I wrong? We don't really have, I mean, we've got booking agents, uh, right? You know, but we don't have like you know, a guy saying, right. Well, you should do this and this, you know, we don't have that, right? You know, were you getting, were both of you individually or collectively or whatever, however that works, were you getting any like big? feeler offers like hey we'd love to have you on this fest or that fest i mean forbidden just as an example with craig the the european festivals kept coming to him going what would it take to get forbidden back and forbid and, and craig's like nothing russ is retired it's done it's over and then that kind of changed when he did bay area interthrational and suddenly there was was skinner and so i guess what i'm getting at was was anybody approaching you with like hey we're gonna pay it twenty thousand dollars and fly you over here and we'll take care of you it's all was that happening at all or no i think prophecy had had talked to you prophecy put out a feeler like two years ago and and even when they emailed me directly they were like this is a total shot in the dark but i'm just curious could this ever happen and i wrote back and i said you know we're, there's nothing happening right now you know and i did say like you know who knows what will happen never say never kind of thing right and it never, I just forgot about it. So when we made the decision to do this, and I know there's always going to be suspicion, there was not an offer on the table. I mean, we knew we would get offers. We knew we were aware right. of people's desire to have us get back together, but there was no carrot dangling in front of us. There was no $20,000 offer that prophecy just happened to get back a hold of me. And I said, well, by the way, yeah, just like last <laughs> month or whatever it was, we actually decided to do it. So you know, go ahead and make us an offer and see where it goes. Uh, right. But no, we were literally prepared to just contact our booking agent from before and say, can you find us our local, a local gig here in Portland? That was the original idea. Um, and then go from there. Which is what I thought you did a warm up, but it turns out it was kind of the other way around. You did yeah. prophecy and then did the warm up, but it wasn't really the warm up it was the, the home gig. Jimmy, um, you got anything on this and then we'll jump well, in. I was going to say, it's kind of like the stars aligning because uh, I mean, that, that prophecy fest, I mean, uh, the venue in uh, Germany, uh, I had never actually heard of before, but uh, it just looked like so unique and eclectic and just kind of like a, you know, for a band that does like, you know, regular style venues to get to do something like that. Mm -hmm. Just, 
really kind of special it looked like and uh, just the layout and if anybody doesn't know go look on instagram or whatever prophecy fest 2023 it's just like a it's like a cave in germany that uh, the, the mm -hmm. venue is held and a lot of great bands too did you guys i mean how was the how was the show how was the rest of the bands the fans i mean it looked like it was real real success it was interesting because it was it was largely a hum, a homecoming for us because a lot of the bands that were playing were bands that we had toured with before, played festivals with before. I mean, I'd say half that lineup were bands that were friends of ours, like November's Doom, like Saturnus, like Dornenreich, which our book our European booker is the drummer of Dornenreich. Okay. Um, the Vision Bleak, I've toured with them. You know, so it's just like it was kind of kind of interesting how it was almost like a the family was getting back together in a lot in a weird way. All your homies. I, yeah. I talked to Paul. I did an interview with Paul a couple weeks ago and we actually discussed it. I'm like, dude, what was it like playing in a fucking cave, man? Like what, what is that like? He's like, it was just epic. And he brought up you guys. I think you guys are really good friends because <laughs> you guys go way back. One of the first times I almost saw you, I've never seen you. Jimmy has my, my situation was when you guys were touring, I had little, little kids, my wife, my ex-wife now, but she worked when I just couldn't get out. You know what I mean? It just didn't work. But I remember you guys playing DC or maybe it was, it might've been MDF. I can't remember, but you were with, you did some tour with November's doom, right? Yeah. That would have been the nine thirty club in Washington. Nine thirty. That's it. Yeah. 2004. Well, 2004. yeah. Right. 2004. My kids were, you know, eight and nine, seven and nine or something like that. And I was yeah. like, I came so close, but my wife said, if you go to that show, your stuff will it'll be out on the front porch when you get home. So kind of one of those type things. But um, yeah, so talk a little bit about that, John. Was it, was it like, was it trippy playing in a cave like that? Was it kind of mind blowing? It was clammy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sweaty. It dripped. It dripped. It oh. It was, yeah, we, we uh, were the only band that had a sound check. And so we, at nine in the morning, we, we went and had a sound check and it was, yeah, it was really crazy. Cause it's like, you know, it's, it's damp in the cave. Your hands are cold. I play guitars with metal necks. It, you know, it right. was like, it was interesting. Oh, yeah. So. Well, um, and when you're doing that, I did have a question about this uh, relative to that. You're, Typically, you're you're taking their backline. They're providing backline. I'm sure, right. right? Did you? Are you guys? I know both you guys are amp head guys. You're amp dudes, right? So, and we're gonna get into a gear question later. I have to because Don, we never got there last time, and I really do want to do that before you leave. So, give me the high sign. But um, have you been tempted, like for flying gigs like that, to get into the Kemper impulse response thing with you know Axe Effects or or anything? I'm just curious because. That makes think you get that consistency, whereas you probably won't get that with every every orange head is different and every cabinet's different, right? Um, it's interesting. So my my other band, Polorian, the the guitarist that was in that band used a Kemper, so I got mm -hmm. to see how that worked up close, and I didn't like it. It it just seemed very sterile the sound. I mean, it just it still to me sounded like a digital amp, and even though it's it's a better sounding digital amp it just i don't know um for the convenience sure it was great uh marcus stock um from the vision bleak slash imperium he's using a german made amplifier that's actually fits on his on his pedal board and it's tube it's a tube it's a little tube amp and it sounds in amazing wow and it's some german company it's handmade it, it, yeah and so you know, I would I would be open to something like that for sure. But, you know, I've never really had any problems with renting a backline. OK, you know, I've had more problems with my own amps than I have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So how about you, Don? I mean, I know you're a purist to a large extent, too. So, um, yeah, and I mean, the only I reason I bring it up, the only reason yeah. I bring it up is, as I told you, Don, I've got some money coming my way and I'm getting all I'm getting all itchy finger to go buy lots of expensive gear. And I'm looking at the. The quad cortex was, which is insane. I mean, it's just everything you need, and and I'm kind of getting there, I think. But I get it. So, what was your perspective on that? Yeah, I I keep things very very simple. I like very very simple gear. I don't know at all what either of you are talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair I. Enough. Uh, I, you know, my philosophy is, is also very like, if you, you should, 
if you have a great guitar and a great amp, that's all you ultimately need. Everything else is in your fingers and your hands. Um, but the nice thing about not having anything boutique -y or custom is that one, if anything fails, I can go down to a store and buy it, you know, but I use a JCM 900. Yeah. I was going to ask you to go ahead. We'll just do the gear thing now. But I mean, I, you know, they always sound good to me. I mean, they're consistent amps. And so I never worry about it. As long as the festival has a JCM 900, I'm good. That's all I need. Um, and, and a hundred watt head or a 50? 100. Okay. What are you using cab wise then? Ooh, I mean, just your standard four by 12 cab. I don't know anything about speakers. You're you talking get into speaker shit. I would okay. be terrible in one of those videos, you know, where they go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would just, I don't know what this does. I, I push the button and it makes a delay sound. Or you're not, you're not Pete Thorne then is what you're saying. No, right? I really, I just, I don't care. I just have a, I don't, I don't have time to worry about knobs. What's your effects then? Are you just using like, are you using a delay and, and like some reverb and I, okay. This is, I mean, as this was very entertaining to me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, John's totally you're next opposite. John. So get ready, man. John's totally opposite. I use digital delay and it's a boss uh, for more shreddier leads. So that's very consistent delay. I use analog delay, the carbon copy from MXR, which is beautiful pedal for, you know, my clean tone delays or more atmospheric delays. And then I have MXR's chorus. It has one knob. It's like perfect. If I yep. see more than one knob, I have a panic attack. It just, the degree <laughs> of chorus, you don't need anything else. And uh, I have a blue box for one part that requires it. And a Wawa pedal, man. I mean, I, I play a Les Paul, a Wawa pedal, and a JSM 900. What else do you need? What, what's your Les Paul? What year is that? I don't know. <laughs> I think you're it's right, John, 2010. Is, John, you're right. This is like pulling teeth right here. <laughs> and you just I mean, bought I, another. I, you bought another it, one. Yeah, I have another one. I bought so that the Les Paul custom I have, I bought in 2010. I think it's a 60s reissue. Okay. Probably. I think it's a 65 reissue. I think that's what it is. <laughs> and then I just bought a Les Paul standard uh, gold top. That's a 50s era. That's right. You told me about that. Yeah. And all you I have a Strat is, too, right? Don't you have a Strat? What? And I have a Strat. I have no idea. You got an SG also. Hmm? You got an SG also. I have an SG. It plays like butter. Um, and then I have my old Frankenstein Ibanez from when I was a young kid. But um, yeah, I mean, let me. Just, I'll show you my new guitar real quick here. All right, cool, cool. <laughs> John, right you're there. next. Get ready, man. <laughs> Come I'm coming my your way next. Right here. So okay, cool, cool. Yeah, John hasn't even seen it. Oh man, oh, no, that's wow. nice. That yeah. is pretty. Now, is that a new, brand new one or? Well, it's new? brand new. Yeah. Wow. And the back is the most beautiful part. Oh yeah, that but, maple, that curly maple. Yeah, and it plays smoothly. It's it's just it's a wonderful guitar. It's just a straight up standard. <laughs> um, you know, and I have to admit. I tried to go shopping around like boutique music stores in Portland. Right. And I tried some stuff out. But the thing is, I know, I know everyone's going to call me a poser. But the nice thing about Guitar Center <laughs> is that you can go into a room with five different guitars. Yeah. And my it's wife true. is with me and she has the cable. I put one guitar and boom, and I'll play it. Okay. Next one. Boom. Yep. Play it. Next one. Boom. Play it. And that's how I bought my Strat, and that's how I bought this Paul. <clears throat> so yep. I can really, really lay them all out. You can't really do that at independent stores. So unless I see something at, at a independent store that I know right away I like. Yeah. Unless you've been I going there a lot because you get that weird feeling like they're staring at you by the third guitar going, all right, dude, buy something. That, that kind of vibe. And uh, you're right about Guitar Center. I was in Guitar Center a couple days ago playing acoustics. I bet you I played... 15 taylor acoustics i played every taylor they had because i'm i'm gonna blow a lot of money on a taylor whether i get it there or not yeah. but it was i was in the acoustic room for literally three and a half hours playing so i agree with you on that that front john how about you I, i'm gonna pick your brain a little bit on your gear now what do you want to know about which well which tell me what's that? your your main set of are, are you you have hagstrom right i have i have a couple of hagstroms yeah and you're are you playing electrical instruments the uh, no, those are Travis Beans. Okay, all right. I wasn't familiar have, with that one. I have three Travis Bean guitars. Those are the the seven the nineteen seventies um, mm -hmm. versions. 
Um, I have two Hagstroms. I got a, well, I've got a Hagstrom Viking that I love to death. It's one of my favorite guitars, actually. Um, I got a Hagstrom Baritone that I used in Polorian and I use in my solo stuff. Let's see, I have, I have like nine guitars. <laughs> so, what do you have sitting there? Do you have anything you want to show off quick? Or, uh, well, I have this guy. Oh, okay, oh, the loose uh, site. Dan Armstrong Ampeg. Um, it's a reissue, right? Um, let's see. I got this is that baritone. I was oh, about yeah, that. look at that, man. Semi hollow, yeah, yeah. I, I love semi hollow body guitars. That's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at a PRS right now at Custom 24. Yeah, um, all my Travis beans are, are locked up in the closet and That's the cases, cool. but um, what's your amp setup? You're playing orange, right? Predominantly. Well, I have an, I've got an orange, I've got a, high, I've got an old high watt that, that I used to use that needs some work. It's a 1979 high watt, uh, uh, hundred watt, uh, fuck what's, what's the name of it? Anyway, um, uh, I've got a couple of solid state orange amps. Yeah, <laughs> I've got, I've got some, uh, combo amps that I use from time to time, uh, Fender combo amps. I, I've got a lot of stuff that when, I have. When you're doing Agalock, your primary is what's your head that you're. Yeah, using? Okay, so in Agalock, I use right now, I'm using an orange uh, Rocker Verb MK, uh, MK2 100 watt. And I'm bi amping with. It's actually, it's a, um, it's a Fender. It's a Fender. It's a, it's the solid state version of a Fender twin. Twin. Okay. Yeah. I thought yeah. so. Right. Um, that's your reason, queen tone. That's your AB then. No, 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 no. I, oh. I, I, I sculpt with. I oh, sculpt you're blending. That. You're blending. Yeah, blend tone. Oh, stereo yeah. or non? Uh non. Okay. Yeah, no. Wow. So, and then I've got like a huge pedal board with lots of stuff. <laughs> what's your main? What's your main three pedals? You got to have. Well, Strymon. You you have Strymon. I don't. I don't use Strymon. Um, I I love the dirty little secret for for uh for my gain. Mm -hmm. It's a Catlin bread. Uh, I really like TC electronic pedals. I've had so many delay TC electronics. Um, I use a Rat for the other distortion because what I do is on some songs I'll have say dirty on one amp, clean on the other amp. Sometimes I'll have dirty dirty. Sometimes I'll have clean clean. Sometimes I'll have Reverb on this side, delay on this side. Sometimes I'll have like acoustic simulation on one side, next with a mixed blended with distortion on this side. Now, are you using Paizo or are you or is it a simulated? It's acoustic? a it's a Paizo simulator. Actually. Okay, all right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Wow, man, pretty tricky. And and you guys do <clears throat> do you both play the Ebo on tracks or is it no, mainly done? Me. Oh, that's you. Okay. Yeah, I've got like three Ebos because I yeah, keep I gotta get keep one breaking them. Okay. <laughs> cool cool very cool very cool all right we'll get off the nerdy gear shit because you know i don't want to upset the uh animals and i promised jimmy he'd get to talk so uh let's talk quick real quick and this was we both had this question uh talk quick from both perspectives about adding hunter and what i think i guess maybe that it was a logical ad because of you know him being playing for sculpted but he's not logistically in a good place for you guys because i think he's in georgia i believe thing and and so what what transpired to make that happen because john you mentioned there was you tried some other situations that didn't work yeah we had a we, we had a, a mutual friend locally who tried out and he's a good drummer but i think he's a better studio drummer because it just didn't work out live or in the, in a live setting um we we, we did a, a weekend of rehearsals with him and it just it just didn't have the feeling and at the time, I was fine with that. I was like, okay, cool. You know, I got to play these songs again. It was fun. Um, and then later, you know, after we had kind of decided, well, I guess we're not going to do this, we were we were once again drinking at the Horse Brass, <laughs> uh, one of our favorite places to go. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if it was Don or Jason or even me that brought up Hunter. Do you remember Don? Um, it was either me or Jason because um, our initial goal was to find someone local because we were so tired of having to, now that the three of us 
were living in the same city because there was a right. time when I was in New York for three years and we were like, oh, I don't want to have to keep flying someone out. And things just, we also asked some other people to, if they were interested and it just never materialized. And also all the drummers in Portland are in five bands and they're always touring or something. So, right. so I said, well, look, you know, Hunter pulled this stuff off super quick. He's super creative. He's a huge Agalock fan and he could do it. No problem whatsoever. But yeah, he lives in Savannah, Georgia. And so I played John the next sculptured album, which is still currently being wrapped up on um, the most newest one with Hunter. And I said, well, this is the stuff he can do. He, he doesn't have to be techie, you know, cause he's kind of a Sean Reinhardt, Gene Hoagland guy on sculpture. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, he'll do whatever you want him to do. I mean, his timing is perfect <clears throat> and he's creative and he could pull that off. It would be easy. Kind of my main point. Yeah, we got to fly him out, but if we fly him out, he's going to show up knowing the songs. Get it done, right? Mm -hmm. And did, that was did he funny. have any inkling? Did Did he have any inkling? Did you let him know it might be coming, or no, did you just suddenly no. drop it on him? Say, hey, you're yeah. you're coming out for an audition uh, next yeah. week, Jordan. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I called him up. He'd already done. He's already done the drums for Sculptured. He's both did a demo phase and then the final phase, and then like added percussion to it. So like, he'd already been well in part like the family here, right? And I just called up and I said, well, as you know, like, you know, we're all friends now. We were, I'm sure you could tell what was happening. And I was like, do you want to play drums for Agalock? And he was like, he, without a set, he just, yes. <laughs> yeah, I said, right. do you want to think about it? <laughs> yeah, you want to consider it for a minute? Nope. Nope. Let's do it. He was like, I can do it. I can do it. That's you know, awesome. I know the songs now. I could probably hack at it right this second. If we were all in the same room, I could probably pull a lot of it off. So I said, yeah, we'll have to work out the logistics of flying you out here and, and, and all that. And so eventually we, we finally bought a drum kit, just a band drum kit for him here. Yeah. Things easier. Um, so, yeah, we have to just kind of budget his flight whenever we have a gig, but it's not too much of a problem. John, you're yeah, a drummer. He's, he's also kind of like a heavy metal historian, that guy. I mean, if you listen to Radical Research, uh, has he ever... Yeah giving you guys the discourse on the Abagor discography? Because uh, he seems oh, to yeah. be quite... We already knew about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, he, I mean, we've, we've, or, yeah, I mean, that was the best thing is when he got to hang out with us, we just nerded out on yeah all of our favorite obscure stuff. I mean, we went on and on about Zizma. Um, thought industry. Thought industry, like, like he knows everything. He knows the references. He knows the obscure references. Nice. He's really one of us. He's our same age. Um, can he drink can, like you guys though? No. Hmm? Can he drink like you guys? No, he's he's sober. He's, oh, he's sober. So that's yeah. a that's a, so, a no go. Well, that's actually that's actually a good, th that's a good thing to have a sober drummer. Let's be honest. Oh, yes, yeah. Right. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Usually because, it's the exact opposite. How about it, John? Right. When, yeah, yeah, well, when you I, saw Hunter, were you cool with him, or did you already know about him? I already knew about him, and you know it's great. He okay no. You know, he he's a very, very tight drummer. He's very, like, his timing is impeccable, which is great because I'm not, uh, as a guitarist, I, I'm like mm -hmm. Keith Richards mixed with, with the edge, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's it's really nice to be able to just, to be able to rely on that. You can lie um, back on it a little bit yeah, and know I mean, it's there. Aesop, Aesop was, a, was a great drummer, but he, he it, we had to surf with him. And they liked to do that, but it was really difficult for me because I had to, I had to sing. I had to watch yeah. stuff changes and all that stuff. So it was a, it was very difficult for me, and it often oftentimes it made things. I think maybe a little made me sloppier <laughs> actually. Oh, okay, okay. So, but no, I mean, but but Aesop had I, no disrespect. He had the power, which was really cool, and he brought a lot of great things to, especially the Marrow of the Spirit era. But but Hunter's just yeah, he's just a. I think he's the right balance of the of the technical precision and the power and the personality and everything else. So, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. <clears throat> um, Jimmy, anything more on Hunter? And uh, you had asked, Jimmy, what was the thing you wanted to ask about the uh, any of the other bands that they might have seen at the Prophecy Festival? No, he, no, he already answered that. It oh, did was it? mostly like the bands that they were touring with before. And yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Um, so I asked you about the Axe Effects. We got that out of, out of the way. And Paul Kerr. So, Jimmy, 
you're up, dude. This is your section, man. The Eisenwald stuff. So go for it. Yeah, yeah. We kind of wanted to ask a little bit about, uh, like, you know, I guess ever since you guys, like, you know, disbanded and then uh, there were certain releases coming out. And I guess it was on your own label, Demerung. And uh, all of a sudden we started seeing things coming out on Eisenwald, which is kind of an interesting uh choice because they i guess if you know the label anybody watching this i mean it's the kind of label that uh might it seems like kind of perfect for you guys because they have this sort of aesthetic that kind of fits fits you know the imagery and also they're fairly underground label um and they do a very nice job on their the presentation of their physical releases so and and uh rightfully so on the stuff that they've released so far from mm -hmm. your guys' catalog and uh, obviously that you know there was the the first couple of eps released and then the uh the art book and uh, the new vinyl releases for Pale Folklore. But this thing is like, uh, it kind of reminded me of like what you see from Prophecy. Sometimes they do these really nice media books and uh, just, you know, kind of just a full attention to detail in terms of like just all the pictures that we've never seen and in the interview. And uh, I, I guess I was just curious to like, how, you know, what, what, what was the decision to go with Eisenwald and are we going to see more of your releases uh, or from the back catalog there? Don? Actually, this well, is more. Oh, this, this is, is you. This is, this yeah. is John. Okay. Okay. So should have known that, but sorry. We go back. So uh, we and Eisenwald go back to about to 2012 when Nico reached out to us about reissuing the demo stuff on vinyl, and that ended up becoming a box set. I don't know if you if you guys ever saw that or knew about that. I haven't. No, a, a vinyl box set or a CD. It was, it was a vinyl box set. Okay. Of, Oh, yeah, I think Don is going to show it. Yeah, there oh, we go. Okay. 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 Oh, wait, I have seen that, but I don't own it. Oh, shit. Yeah, so it's a, it was a 12-inch, a 10-inch, and a 7-inch. And a okay. And there's like a booklet and, fo and photos, cards, and all kinds of stuff. And, of course, I was in charge of designing the thing, and I got to know how Nico works very quickly <laughs> because that design became a pissing contest between the two of us. Um, every time I would come up with an idea, he'd be like, well, I've got a better one. <laughs> no, and it's just, okay. and it just, and that's why that thing is so well, there's Elaborate. so many details to it. And, yeah. and that's just how he is. He's a perfectionist and he's a perfectionist with every aspect of everything on his, on his label. Really? I mean, oh, nice. You know, and yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can't really see. What, the, what are those going on discogs for? Was that limited? I'm sure. Right. Uh, limited to 500, I think. So it's yeah, probably it's worth a gazillion dollars now. Yeah. Um, so anyway, and then he ended up putting out the Serpent and the Sphere on, on vinyl and CD in Europe. And uh, he also did a picture disc version of Formation of this Oak. So we just, you know, we had little projects with him and then he did a major album with us. And, you know, he of course he put out the Polarian stuff and you know, we're him. Him and I are great friends. He he went on tour with us on the last couple of tours we did, doing our merch, and he's just a very. He likes to get his hands dirty with with you know the process, and that's mm -hmm. that's a great thing. And we him and I work really well together. Um, he's a moody motherfucker, and so am I. <laughs> <laughs> and he's very very he's very very snickety about everything, and so am I. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so so when the idea came around to it, it was a, it was a slow process because I think the first thing he wanted to to reissue was of Stone Wind and Pillar, and I was like, why? And uh, he just felt that it would be a great thing to. Oh no 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 no! I'm sorry. Let's go back. The first thing he wanted to do was the white and gray piece. Oh Once yeah, again, right. Like why? And uh, he just wanted to do release those in a really extravagant package. And I was like, great. Okay. They're out of print. They're selling for a lot of money on discogs. Why not? Right. So I ended up redesigning all of those. We once again had another pissing contest, <laughs> which resulted in these amazing packages for even, for even the gray EP, which was kind of a throwaway release for us. It was kind of a tour item that we put out in 2004. That's the one with the remixes on it, right? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. But no, he wanted it to be, you know, he wanted them to be a pair and and have the same kind of quality on each, and which is great. So he has a reverence for the material. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. If you look at any of which the releases, which is awesome. Which yeah. is awesome. And it's it's every it's across the board. Every yeah. release he puts out, it's yeah. impeccable quality. 
Um, and then, you know, and then the, the idea to do the, 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 so I guess he had a, he, he, he had a licensing agreement with, with BMG who owns the first three albums. And I was going to ask you, I'm glad you brought that up. That's yeah. who, because that was the end material. Yes. But that was bought out by BMG. Right. Okay. I wanted to know who owned the masters for that. And that's, it's the it's, rights are theirs. Okay. It's BMG. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he got a, a licensing deal for Europe to reissue those, those albums. And he wanted to do something special with, with, with all three of them. And I was like, well, let's have deluxe vinyl. Of course, let's have a book edition for the CDs. And, and it became a thing where it's like, you know, prophecy does have these really amazing, these book editions. And Nico's like, well, let's make ours bigger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I can say the one thing that you had on Prophecy was this nice little gold uh, yep. bookmarker, which is awesome. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. place. That's a that's at least a good two night reading session. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. I wanted to show off something I've got, John and Don. I didn't show you this last time, John. I know it's a little dark in my room. There's a reason why I keep my lights low. But do you remember this one, John? Oh yeah, I yeah. I did snort those ashes just to see what would happen. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm lying. I, I didn't sort them. I was just saying the CDs in my collection, but I I didn't find this. Don, remember we talked about this? I'm like, I have that box somewhere. It's like a wooden box. You were kind of like, I think you were initially. You were like, wait, I don't. Yeah, oh, okay, I remember that thing. But I think this was limited to like 500. I think it was. Right? It was 500, and really, what it was is 250 were with ashes, and 250 were were with bones. They were with what? Bones. Yeah. Wonder which one's worth homes. more now. I don't know, but I put I had to put all that stuff together. <laughs> you did it all, huh? There you yeah, go. Yeah. There's there's the ashes. Now I don't want to yeah. know whose body you burned for that. So, um, and I actually, and actually, the it also came with. Uh, I believe the are these Polaroids or not? They're not real. No, they're not Polaroids. No, they're not Polaroids. The no. card cardstock prints, though, right? Yeah. In fact, those are the. That's the source of the ashes. <laughs> Oh, is that it? Okay. I didn't burn a bird. I'm, I'm, I did not. Okay. <laughs> Here's a but bunch I have of. A uh, skull. I have a raven skull in my collection, so I put it in the in the thing, and yeah, made it look like yeah. There's a bunch of fine young, black metal fellows back in the day. I'm yep. trying. Who's on there? The three of you, and who's the other guy? That's Chris. Oh, Chris is a drummer. drummer. That's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he was on. Uh, yeah. yeah, and then it also came with uh, with an end sticker. That's probably worth a million dollars. <laughs> and I and also the sorry it's dark in here, guys. Agalock sticker. So um, and then the other thing I wanted to show you, John, because you'll probably recognize this really well, is and this was I was like an I was the I was one of the end whores back in the day. Anything they would put out, I would grab. But oh yeah. Yeah, the white one of number is it? One of five hundred. This has never been played. So if anybody wants to pay me seven million dollars for it on my email address is wide open um yeah so uh don what, any anything from you on eisenwald at this point or is that pretty much all just john yeah i mean john's been great i mean i i got to hang out with nico more or less one-on-one -on -one because he was at prophecy fest with us and <clears throat> you know it, yeah he's a super sincere and genuine and yeah he gets his hands real dirty he's deeply committed um yeah, I'm really happy he's a part of our whole family here. So are you guys gonna do the rest of the records like this or yes, that's, that's awesome. We're gonna do well, we're gonna we're gonna finish up the first three because of the licensing deal that he has. Oh, the BMG stuff, yeah. right. And I I have pretty much finished the mantle book. I'm still waiting for some quotes. I'm waiting for Nez from Alsace to give me his quote and Nicholas Sundin from Dark Tranquility to give me his quote and some other people. Um but yeah, I mean, aside from that, it's that it's all done. I, I submitted the, the 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 vinyl layouts, the tape layouts, already, and the masters for the CD and the bonus CD, those are done, and those have been submitted. So, yeah, and then any, I'll get, any ETA on those, or is it hard to say yet? I mean, it really depends. I Nesh said Nesh told me that he was going to get me his quote sometime in November, so. He'll probably be the last one. What's and he what doing? Can I ask what he's doing? He's on tour. No, what's he doing? He's doing a quote. Like, you know, on the Pale Folklore one, there's quotes from... I, from I don't... I don't. Oh, the quote quote in the book. I'm sorry. I thought he was quoting book, yeah, some yeah. price like he was re, no, 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 remastering no. or something. I'm like, no, wait, no, 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 he's doing no. that? Okay. 
right. You see where I was confused there. I yeah, got yeah, it. No. yeah. Got gotcha. you. Um, very, very cool. Um, because I, I was wondering, Jimmy and I were talking before you guys came on. We're like, you know, we're at the twentieth already. Now we're heading more towards the twenty fifth. But I would imagine it'll be out long before the twenty fifth, right? It'll be out next year, or probably yeah. some early next year, hopefully. Nice. nice. I think he submitted the vinyl for for the test presses. So, yeah, it's it's underway. And I've already awesome. started. Like I already have the the vinyl layouts done for Ashes and the tape layout, and I've started the book on that one. So I'm gonna try to get that finished by the end of the year. Cool, <clears throat> killer man. Yeah, much work he's doing. Sorry, What's you see how much work he's doing. <laughs> and then and then and then I get to start Marrow the Spirit. <laughs> we, might well, that's what I'm saying. we might as well play a show. Like dudes overwork. Always, always good. Um, so I don't want to to learn to play the songs, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, that oh, that's a great point. I'm glad you bring that up. Um, you've got the big one in you're there. You're headlining the second day of Decibel Fest in Denver, which Jimmy, I believe you're going to, right? Because yeah, I, I live in Colorado there. Springs, so yeah, I'll do. I mean, I for sure I'll be there. Yeah, I already got my ticket. So unfortunately, I don't see myself getting out there because of it's a little ways for you issues. Mm -hmm. Well, just other issues, you know. Um, but you know, it, it's a really good uh, lineup and. I was kind of curious about that, Don. How much wood shedding do you have to really put into kind of reconnecting those synapses to get into these songs? Now, you've already done the two sets. Are you going to stick with the same? Oh, I probably shouldn't ask that question, but I'm going to. Are you going to stick with the same question or set? Or are you going to try to maybe throw one surprise track in? Or Yeah, there'll be some differences. Um, uh, it's not, you know, it is. It's like riding a bike. I mean, uh, they do come back because we were playing those songs constantly every night. Um, <clears throat> so they do really come back every now and then I do have to type in some, <laughs> some tabs online and find some Agalock fan that's tabbed them out. So I was just going to say, you go out and find some dude on YouTube that, uh, to give me a, you know, plays it better than you, right? <laughs> <laughs> if I, yeah, find someone and they're like, okay, is that what I did? I don't know. It's a different fingering, maybe. There's a kid I, in. I, I use oh, YouTube. Sorry. What's that, John? I look at old live footages of, of us yeah. playing. Oh, you watch on yourself? YouTube. Yeah. You watch your hand yeah. position. Yeah, like, oh, position. that's where that was on the net. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's a dude. That, you got to understand the, the, all the fans who have, the, who have their cameras up, what they're really doing is giving us a practice video in the future. <laughs> That's They're a good helping way you listen. out crazily now, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, we didn't play these songs for eight years. It doesn't take much. It's mainly just memory. I think what's more important for me is just to get my fingers in shape. So I spend a lot of time just playing guitar, like just soloing and improvising and just doing exercises on my fingers and, you know, just getting into it. And that helps even more than I think playing the songs. Since there's a dude, I think he's in France. You know the guy I'm talking about that – Literally has every freaking Agalock song note for note played. Have you ever seen that guy? No. No, but we should hire him. I, I, <laughs> you should. You probably should. Actually, I mean, he could he could sit down and instruct you guys probably on all your parts. He does um, Shadow of Pale, and he he's got like a bunch of. Them. I'll find it and send it to you, Don. Uh, but um, Don, since you're gonna have to jet fairly soon, let me um, transition to. Uh, well, I did want to ask about the the home. Uh, show in portland which looked really fun cool old uh sort of a theater type venue i think it looked like sort of like a multi-tier uh, theater looked like it was pretty full now i i'm gonna ask do you have any idea how what the capacity was because it looked like there might have been i don't know 800 people there or more or something am i overstating it no it's 1500 oh 15 i'm sorry man i'm terrible at that shit i can never it's very you know, deep the venues goes very yeah deep. it looked yeah. long it looked as a balcony yeah and i was surprised that it sold out as well um we've always wanted to play that venue ironically both pelorian and karata did at the same festival but different years okay but i never got to play it and it was been a venue on our bucket list it's one of the best venues in portland the crystal ballroom and when we were able when we got it i was like oh maybe we'll fill it pretty well but i didn't I didn't think for a second we were going to sell it out. I was just as surprised that we sold it out. I think I think Crystal was too. <laughs> Did you have people out front scalping or trying to get tickets? Yeah, there was like, yeah. scalpers. Yeah, yeah, there was scalpers, and that, that's when you know shit's good. That's like, yeah, this is we've made the grade. It's like old old Judas Priest. Uh, what's it called? The what's the thing called in the parking lot thing? 
heavy metal parking lot, right? Everybody's outside doing the the scalping oh, right, thing. Right. What? Uh, how about you, John? What was your perspective on? And I will say, Don, you were having the time of your life at that show, man. You were like totally getting into it because you, you seem like such a fairly reserved kind of not mellow. That's probably not the word, but you you know you're. We've talked about this. You're an intelligent. Both you guys are very intellectual guys, but but you seem very kind of reserved in that way. And you were totally being the rock star up there, man. You were, you know, just doing the whole the whole thing and falling on the ground and sort of ripping your strings off. And I'm like, who is what this? Fucking, guy? Who is this guy, man? Well, you know, it's like Eric the Viking. You know, you yeah. got you, you got to save it so you go berserk. If you go berserk too soon, you'll have none left for battle. <laughs> oh shit! I totally forgot about that scene, man. Yeah, uh, John, how about you? What was your perspective on that that home show like that? Oh, it was fun. I mean, I love playing that venue. Um, I loved playing it with Florian and I, you know, I always wanted Agalock to play it because it felt like, you know, because Agalock and, and McMinimins, we go way back. You know, McMinimins is the company that owns the Crystal Ballroom and they own a, a bunch of different like breweries and restaurants and hotels all over the place. And they're very artistic and interesting. If you ever come to Portland, you should definitely check them out. Um, so and I wrote, I wrote the lyrics to the mantle in the little red shed, which is on one of the big minimums properties. And so to play the crystal ballroom was like full circle for, for us. Um, and, and the other thing is, is the crystal ballroom opened in 1997, which is the year that we put out our first demo. So oh, it, it's like yeah. there are a lot of little things and, uh, I, yeah, I loved it. Uh, I had technical difficulties right off the bat. <laughs> okay. Just doing the changeover. They didn't plug in my, my loop station that has the intro to limbs. Oh <laughs> so shit. That was a little bit of a spinal tap moment, but we, we went through it. We, we did it, dealt with it and got the show on the road and it was, it was good. Um, I'm, I'm not as animated live as Don is because I've got too much to do. I've yeah, got, right. I got a sing, I got a, a, a effects and I'm just not, I'm not, that guy. I don't have that, that kind of energy on stage. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I like to be more of the surly one, I guess. <laughs> But yeah, and that's the kind of the interesting thing about Agalock is we each have our own sort of stage persona and it gives the audience something unique to list, to look at while we're playing. What were you doing with the bowls at the end? I didn't quite get what was going on there. Oh, um, those cauldrons, I burn wood smoke incense in those mm. cauldrons. Nice. Yeah, to kind of get the mood going, you know, and Usually it's the wood smoke and there's the fog, but our fog machine is really powerful. And after the first song, they're like, you're going to set off the fire alarm. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I saw a prophecy <laughs> fest. You guys were engulfed, man. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's just, it's all part of the, of the ambience on stage, you know, that we like to, to perform in. That was super uh, cool. Are you yeah. doing that in Denver? You'll do something similar. I would assume. I mean, if they've got fog machines i'm not going to take the incense because it's a festival it's okay it's a little more chaotic yeah you i don't usually don't do the incense at festivals very quick turn around you kind of have to you're yeah. off and then it's you, know. you got to get in and get out yeah yeah right we um, made the portland show as special as we could we wanted to make it very portland centric and so uh <clears throat> we had a a painting by david DeAndrea specifically for it that had a reference to a uh, portland film director named gus van sant Oh, nice. Who's oh, known for? Uh, oh yeah, that poster Boy. is wicked, man. Yeah. And so, it's are you selling those? Did you get them all, or yeah, did they? But it's did... a reference to my own private Idaho, which opens with the scene of Keanu Reeves and River Phoenix sitting together underneath the elk statue that's on the cover of the mantle. So we kind of did like a little homage to Gus Van Sant's film. Was one of our, you know, he's our Martin Scorsese in Portland. Okay, yeah, <laughs> he's yeah, like yeah. a Portland filmmaker. And uh, and then we did a cover of the Wipers, who are one of the most legendary Portland punk bands. Oh, nice, Don. I have a since you're going to want to jet here shortly. And John, can I have you for a little bit longer? Are you cool? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, let's uh, let's talk about sculpture. You said he's done drums. I assume you're well on the way to having that finished, or where are you at with the new sculpture? Yeah, I mean everything's recorded. Jason's doing bass at the moment. He tells me. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't have a label. I have nothing. I don't know. I, whatever will happen will happen. But it's uh, the album is all done. It's probably somewhere between Embodiment and Apollo Ends. Excuse me. It has. I'm, I'm bringing back my death metal vocals, and uh, yeah, Hunter's phenomenal on it. It's 
I'm really super happy with it. <clears throat> Are you doing, do you have cleans on it as well with the, yeah, the cleans as well? Hair? Okay. Yeah. I've always liked having both. I love vocal melodies and harmonies, but I also mm -hmm. love growl vocals. So it's, you know, it's kind of the edge of sanity influence that I've had since I started. Right. Sculpture. Edge of sanity was a big influence. What about, um, you know, when you last were on, when we did the catacomb show, uh, you had talked about, you had something coming out. I believe it was a chapter in a book, I believe on Giallo or am I wrong? Yeah. About yeah. That? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's, that, yeah. Let me show you. Yeah, oh, yeah. Cool. yeah. Here it is. This is a collection of essays on Italian Giallos and it, has, blow it up. Hang on one sec here. And it has my essay on Julio Kesti's incredibly weird film, Death, Light and Egg. But okay. yeah, let's say narratives. Um, if anybody wants to get that, can you send me a link to where? Yeah, I can send you a link to this. It's, it's yeah, send a me a link so I can put it in the uh, description. And also available in paperback. Um, am I wrong in saying that you you left Instagram for a little while, which you told me about? Are yes. you back, kind of, sorta, no, or no? Never, You're not. I'm never. I'm over all social media. I'm. You know, here's there the is thing. a sculpt. There's a sculptured Instagram out there. Have you yeah. Seen that? No. No. There's no sculptured Instagram. There's a sculptured YouTube and a Facebook, which I never. No, well, there's a sculptured. There is a sculptured Instagram. I didn't. No, I should have no, probably no, looked before. Well, there's something out there because I posted it in, in the in the description. I'll get rid of it. There but was I, thought, point, I but thought it was you. That's why I put it there. I completely off social media. I want to have as much of a quiet mind as possible. Yeah, um, I got right. blame, man. I don't need. <clears throat> you know, yeah, negative comments suck. But you know, if I tell myself like, okay, I don't need negative comments. I also don't need positive comments. I mean, why do I need either? Yeah. Why can't I just live the most pure, you know, kind of life possible and just do things because I want to do them? And I don't worry about what people think or say. I don't want to hear chatter. I don't want to know what comments are. I don't. I hear you. I get you. I get. I you. literally just all I want. For my my dream in Aglock is to like just I play a gig, I go home, I go to bed. <laughs> I don't want to think about comments. I don't want to know what people are putting on YouTube. I want to go to bed, wake up, and be like, I'll play another gig in a couple months. We're like the Fraser approach to metal. <laughs> yeah, you guys really. I mean, well, okay, so here's a question about that. So this is for both of you quick here. And then, John, we're going to get into you once once Don splits. Um, that didn't sound right, but you get what I'm saying. But um, the, 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 the question I had is, do after all this time, particularly with these new – Gigs. You guys hadn't played a gig in how long was it? Twelve? No, eight years. Oh, maybe. eight. Okay. Yeah, it was twenty. Tw when did you split up? Twenty sixteen. But our last show was in Greece in twenty fifteen. So yeah. okay, yeah. so it's been eight years. All right. Do was there was there any anxiety and any you know? Do you get stage nerves at all? Do you get? that kind of thing. Um, Cause I'm a, I'm a player and I've played before, but I struggle a lot with anxiety in my normal life. So to get up on stage has been a, sometimes a very terrifying experience and I haven't done it in a long time as a result, but I'm just curious about your own personal sort of thing with that. And if you do, how you kind of combat it or whatever. Don, do you want to handle well, this? First? At the crystal, I went record shopping cause there's a record store next door. So, uh -huh. <laughs> Perfect. I avoided it. No, I get. I'm anticipatory. Yeah, same um, here. I don't have stage mm -hmm. fright or anything, but I have that kind of uh, anxious energy. But it's more mm -hmm. of a positive kind. It kind of gets you revved up. And as soon as I walk out on stage, the nice thing about what I've enjoyed playing with Aglock is that it does feel like stepping into a different character and kind of world with the fog. I can smell the incense once the you know the feedback starts to rumble. Like it becomes something else. Like a and once I see the crowd, it's gone. I feel perfectly comfortable, perfectly at ease. And then it becomes a kind of religious experience, very cathartic experience. And it just comes out, you know, from there. Um, you can kind of channel that nervousness into yeah, the, yeah. the energy of the sound yeah. and the, and the, the things yeah. around you. Yeah. It's over. It's over like that. As soon as no I way, really. walk on stage, not nervous at all. I That's amazing. Trapped on and I'm kind of Zen. At that point, Crazy. Yeah, 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 yeah. How about you, John? Anything with you at all? Um, I don't get nervous at all. I get really tired right before we have to play, though. It's strange. Huh. Um, uh, but I will say this: the show at, at Prophecy Fest, right as so, while they were setting up our stuff during the changeover, and they draw, they they put down the curtain and all this stuff, and I was back 
kind of be behind the in the backstage area, I guess. Um, on there was like another curtain behind the drums, and then there's like mm -hmm. a backstage. Mm -hmm. I had n almost a panic attack. Wow. I don't know if Don. I don't know if Don saw this. You guys were down down at the end of the stairs, but I was right. like literally sitting. I was sitting on the drum on the drum riser that Dark Her had, and mm -hmm. um, and I was just like my hands in my in my face. I was like, "Fuck! What are what are we doing? Why am I here?" I was having yeah. that kind of yeah. You got, trying, that, you got that that neurochemical flood. Yeah, yeah. And that was a. I think that was the first time that's ever happened to me. Cause it's you like, think it was because you were away so long and this was just the big it was moment? That, yeah. I think it was the buildup because we had been, you know, we're the last band playing. So we had been there all day from nine in the morning until tired. And we we're just like, you know, when's this going to fucking get going? I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, Jason took a nap backstage and, you know, Don and Hunter were talking to fans all day and I was talking with other bands all day. And it was just by the time we had to play, it was I was exhausted. And so yeah. it finally hit me, you know, I went, I, you know, I got my guitar, I put on my blazer, I'm like getting ready to go. And it was just like, I just shut down for a second. Yeah, I, It probably was all that, <laughs> as Don said, that anticipation, yeah. let's get here, let's do it. And then you've got to wait all that time. And then you, you have too much time to actually think about it to a large extent. Right. And that, that's really why I, I, I don't like having any social media because I'm just, I'm not looped into yeah. this constant Loop. you know, constant feedback of yeah, you want to be in the moment. a chorus of voices and things. And yeah. so I can look at it and be like, I'm just playing a gig, man. Yeah. 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 But you know, it's a gig and that's, and I play the gig. But all day, you know, we had fans telling us how much it meant to them and how that was hard. Yeah. That was, that's was a lot of stress, like, right? Yeah. yeah I was just like, oh stress, my God. Right? What, you know, it's like, what if I break a string? What if I fuck this up? What if, yeah. what if something happens? Oh my, you know, what are we doing? Yeah, <laughs> Why are we doing this? <laughs> people telling us how far they traveled. They came yeah. from India. They came from, you know, the Middle <clears throat> East. They came from uh, all over the place. And I'm like, you know, nightmare thing. Uh, Don, I think you know this. Um, Stephen Wilson. From Porcupine Tree, yeah, a good buddy of mine from many years ago, and um, we've actually reconnected recently. I'm hoping to have him on shortly. But um, <laughs> we were in San Francisco at the famous, the world famous um, Fillmore, Fillmore, right? You know, and all of a sudden, man, out of nowhere, he's like, "I, I have to hand the mic off to John and uh, and uh, Gavin." And he runs off the stage and here he got the shits, right? I mean, that was the reality of what happened. That has to be the most terrifying moment. That's what I fear about getting on stage is that I'll get sick and I'll be like, you know, something horrible will happen. But I'm not going to ask you guys if that's ever happened. But the point is that that's kind of like those one of those anxiety loop moments where if you're not feeling good all day and then you got to get on there and you got to, you know, you got to expend that energy and do that. That could be a terrifying moment, I would think, right? I mean, I also try to eat something protein rich and make sure I'm hydrated. I mean, simple, right. simple things like that is a no brainer. Hey, Jimmy, do you have anything for Don specifically, real quick, before we get him out of here? I don't think so, man. I just wanted to say thanks for coming on again and uh, looking forward right. to seeing the show in Denver. My pleasure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, I, we can run into each other. Uh, please yeah. If I see you, I'll say hi. Definitely. Man. I'll look for you. Um, yeah. All right. Well, that was one more thing I had before you run, Don. Um, yeah, yeah. You, it's interesting because you talk about the 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 Instagram, the the feed, Facebook, the loop of that kind of feedback of of not wanting necessarily to hear the over embellishment of "Oh my God, you're the greatest," and "Oh, you know, my life depends on you guys," and you've got you know that kind of stuff I, I juxtaposed with the man. You guys came back and you really sucked this time. You just sounded like <laughs> shit. But you do tend to be pretty fan friendly when you're at the shows and kind of afterwards. You, yeah. te you tend, I think you guys are all fairly engaging. Although, John, you're probably, I've heard that you're the least engaging, just saying. That's, I have a story about that that I'll get to when Don Okay, we'll talk about it. I did want to ask you, and, and I, I'm going to, you admitted to something that you said you watched the, the uh, thing, and I'll admit to something that I, when I asked Don to do this, I said, John's not going to do this. He's, he's not going to jump on here. And that's just what I was thinking, right? And when Don told me, I said, well, who's going to come on? He's like, no, it's going to be me and John. I'm like, really? Like, John's going to come on and do this show? Wow, okay. So it's And that's not an indictment on you. It's just I know 
you kind of tend to be a little more insular, I think, right? Yeah. And so yeah, we'll I, mean, I like that. I make it I make it a a I really like to go out and meet people because they've come so far. Right. And all they want is a photo or a signature, and you know it's it's very humbling. It's touching. I mean, yeah, it's nice to hear those things. I have to admit, of course, but it's you know I mean I knew what it was like when I would meet people. I mean, I remember seeing Bruce Dickinson's solo show with Adrian Smith way back in, I don't know when it was. And I waited outside and I got to meet Bruce Dickinson and Adrian Smith. And it was like, you know, I mean, that's fantastic. Mind blowing. Right. And so I keep that in mind. I remember, you know, I would do that all the time. Whenever a band, Morbid Angel come through, I met Trey Azikoff and Pete Sandoval and, you know, these, it's a wonderful thing. And uh, so it's, it, and that's the thing, the reunion, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, the three of us have reunited, but really like what John said about the bands of prophecy, it felt like we were u- reuniting with our friends and it also felt like we were reuniting with the fans, many of whom have seen us before. And it felt like a big reuniting experience with everybody involved, fans, other bands, everything. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I think it's, um, I don't know, and you sound like you totally get it, but I don't know if every and get listen every guy that does this as a profession, it's just kind of your job, but it's also your passion, right? It's the thing that you feel very passionate about, and I will say that in general, most rock metal, and I want to get more into the metal realm of things, they tend to be more engaging with regards to understanding of the importance of what it kind of means to the fans to just have that 20 seconds or maybe a minute and a half or two minute conversation. uh, As long as people aren't time vampires, you know what I mean? That can be its own little problem, which I'm guilty of. Sometimes I have to rein it in and go, don't be that guy, you know, but it's hard to do when you're, you're talking to a guy that you admire as a player or as an artist or the writing or whatever. So um, yeah, I think uh, Don, I think I'll probably let you go. The only thing I, um, I did want to ask you before we wrap up and then we'll talk to John a little bit here more. What are you listening to these days? Cause I know you were really into kraut rock the last time we talked. Are you still on that um, tip? Let me show you what I'm listening to. Cool. Cool. Yeah, well, you can see it, but this has been the record I've been listening to a lot. Pharaoh Sanders is karma. Okay. So what I'm really into is this sort of spiritual jazz, cosmic jazz. Like Sun Ra? Yes. I've been trying. Sun Ra is hard to crack. I still have still yeah. not. <laughs> There's only gone. 9 million <laughs> albums to crack, right? Uh, but uh, yeah, getting like Alice Coltrane. Okay. Um, obviously, John Coltrane's A Love Supreme. I've been trying to get into later Coltrane. It's It's been very challenging. <laughs> I feel tremendous guilt. Like I'm not avant-garde enough. But like Pharaoh Sanders, Alice Coltrane, those have been my big constant listening to over and over i just picked this up and man this is the steel deal of a century this thing was going for well over 100 bucks for the longest of time it's a little bit i mean it's in that realm but it's not exact but let me let me show you this just got this insane what i got this for oh yeah the west montgomery eight cd box set now i thought it was coming in like a clamshell thing like the small size mm-hmm. of a cd it's kind of like a almost like a like a big seven inch but check this shit out so it's got a slip it's got this hard shell book right with a f hole uh mm. thing and then each one of the, it's got a nice <clears throat> you know, write up nice booklet in here with all the the write up on all the albums from verb i believe these are all the verbs i believe and eight cds in there man with all bonus tracks in it did Eisenwald put that out? It looks like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it looks like it, could be say, it sounds like they didn't work with Deco. <laughs> believe it or not, yeah. believe it or not, it's freaking. I believe it's UPMC, right? Uh, it's Verve. What the hell? Hold on. Yeah, they're gonna have Universal Music up, you know? UMC. Guess how much I got this for? Hmm. Just take a wild guess. I don't know, Fifty dollars. <laughs> Twenty-one dollars. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, On close. eBay, I just threw the offer at the guy and he jumped at it. And I'm like, man, this thing's going to come. It's going to be beat. Even though he says it's brand new, it's going to be broached brand new in the shrink. Like, whoa. So that one I've got to dive into. And Wes is my favorite, one of my favorite yeah. guitar players of Wes, all time. So, yeah. 
All right. Well, listen, man, we want to thank you for being here, Don. Anything else from you, Jimmy, real quick on with Don? No, I don't think so, man. Again, thanks, dude. Really appreciate uh, you coming on I'll again. See you in Denver. I think yeah, you for sure, man. Play. Jimmy, Can't did you want to ask gig. him? Sorry. Did you want to ask him the one question about um, do you guys keep pulse on the current metal scene? Does anything stick out or? You, yeah, I guess looking? we were kind of curious. I mean, we always kind of figured you guys weren't as much more into the modern kind of metal stuff that's out today. I mean, even though there's, I mean, that kind of is a wide range of things. But, uh, you know, I mean, like even like playing at Prophecy, I was wondering if there was any bands like that kind of stuck out to you. Obviously, you already talked about a lot of the ones that you already knew about and things like, you know, especially like I, I was going to bring up like the neo folk scene because like I don't know if it was like a, as big of a scene in terms of like the bands that are out now versus like when you guys first started. But when you see bands like, uh, you know, like Wilkins Men and uh, Thurnin is another one, fairly new one. Very, very, very good neo folk stuff. The Winter Fi Left neo folk record, you know, it seems to be kind of more of a thirst for that thing. I was just wondering, you know, if you guys had a pulse on any of that stuff. No, the other day I listened to Storm the Lights Bane. Yeah. Nice. Can't go wrong with that. Tried right? and true there. <laughs> I, I never wanted to be this, but because I had older friends who seemed frozen in their era, and I thought, I'll never be frozen in my era, but mm -hmm. I'm frozen in my it's era. It's happened. Man. It, it happens all of us, buddy. <laughs> really it comes easy. with age, man. You just kind of get to a point to where, you know, and it's weird yeah. because, like, it, you see a lot of the bands doing the same old thing, really. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to find something really unique in the metal yeah, scene. I mean, I've been listening to uh, Amon Ra more. Just because we played with them in a couple of fests, and I've always been kind of curious, so I finally did spend some time with their records, and I like I like them. Um, but I don't listen to a lot of metal, and I don't mean yeah. that to sound elitist or something. I mean, oh, I I mean it's a classic metal, but I'm just my my head right now is in jazz and classical, and um, you know my old stuff, you know, Carnage. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I listened to Dark Recollections a couple of days ago. <laughs> I just you know, those... I right. It's always embarrassing when you meet these bands because. Yeah. I mean, John and I can tell you a funny story about meeting Septic Flesh. I haven't listened to anything post a fitting wheel. So we met them at a fest. And I was like, oh, I'm such a big fan. But when I'm saying that, what I mean is I'm a big fan of the records you probably don't remember how to play. <laughs> right. Yeah, they're a bit different in the modern. You know, we were joking about the Amorphous book that came out. And I'm like, I probably only care about the first few chapters. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You know. You're right. right. So we, do, we do tend to get somewhat stuck in our time unless something blows our mind you know what i mean and, and just pulls us back in but no this is one i haven't i never did i known about her forever and of course you know the 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 hit songs or whatever but i just picked this up um the yeah where is it there fish people oh, yeah okay. it's um uh kate bush's first seven and all in brand new digipacks and and man, this this woman is just crazy talented, and I've never huge, really discovered it. Huge or fan. Del What's that? I'm a huge Kate Bush fan, and I know you love this band, John. Oh, yeah. oh, grab oh, this box oh. set just now, <laughs> and I knew I've had these guys on CDR forever, and I finally was like, man, I gotta own some real physical copies, and so that was a big one that I grabbed there. So, but it, I mean, it, you, you never know, we ripped them off. Like, I mean, yeah. you guys have only Honestly. ripped them off. Oh, God. listen! Listen to the Watchmen off of the Nef off of the fields off the Nephilim, and then listen to Hallways of Enchanted Ebony. Yeah, Was it, who wrote that song? Just well, curious. I, I, I well, I did. <laughs> <laughs> there but you I mean, go, right? You have to consider also my solo stuff is very oh, yeah. influenced. <laughs> We're actually going to talk about that next. That's why I'm glad you're sticking right. around a little bit. So. I'll let you guys do that. All right, Don, man, thank you so much Cheers, for Don. joining us. Thanks right. for setting this up with uh, John. Yeah, no and I'll, I'll see you guys later. I promise I won't email you for at least a week or two. Don't worry. All right, see you, buddy. Right. See you guys later. There's All right, man. I think I'm going to go to a – how's this view? Does that work for That's you? That's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Put you down here, John. Yeah, sleeping at that. Uh, <laughs> Jimmy, you had a lot of questions for John, and then I had a few then, too, and then we'll – We'll get him out of here before the night gets too old, too. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, mine kind of go around, but um, I, I guess like kind of we were going to talk a little bit about your solo career, but I noticed like kind of just watching, uh, you know, some of what you've been doing with that stuff and, you know, and noticing like some of the influences, for example, I know 
Cormac McCarthy is kind of a big one there and uh, rest in peace actually uh, still haven't read the, the, the two most recent books that he's released, but uh, I've heard them. They were really good, but I wanted to ask you, um, you know, in reading some of that kind of stuff, are you, have you ever read the book um, blood and thunder by Hampton sides? No, it's no, more of a history. So I'm not really sure if you're kind of like in the history kind of books, but it's, yeah, it's more just kind of like Western conquest, like late 1800s. It's kind oh, of a, I like kind it. of a like full, you know, <laughs> Uh, you know, biography of Kit Carson, but it also goes a lot into like the Navajo conflict and a lot of the stuff that was going on, like really revolved around New Mexico at the time. It's a really great book. It's yeah. just hard to put down when you, if you pick it up. Hmm. Really awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, sounds interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, so, yeah, I sort of, I'm <clears throat> very much like a wilderness guy. Like I do like hiking channel and just kind of like tie like metal music into it, things like that. So um, I was just curious, like how um, I noticed that you're like really big into Finland and uh, you've, you've, you know, obviously been there a lot. How does Finland compare to like some of the landscapes that we have here? I mean, is it completely different? I've never actually been to any of those countries. Um, it's, it reminds me kind of, of, of Minnesota. That's what it kind of, it, it's very similar to Minnesota, the landscapes. Um, and I have a lot of North, friends. Northern like, Minnesota, I'd imagine, right? Yeah, the forests and the lakes. And yeah. it's, it's kind of overall flat, but there's lots of forests and lakes. Um, I, I don't know. I, I was always attracted to Finnish culture, you know, the saunas and the early metal bands, not not the new metal bands. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, like the old Finnish metal scene was great. <clears throat> and I've got a lot of friends there. I went, that was the first, like, well, it wasn't the first European country I went to, but it was the first one I stayed at for a long time. And yeah, it was, you know, it's cool. I, I actually had an opportunity to move there and I turned it down because I just, you know, I like it. It's a nice place to visit, but it's a nice, it's also a nice place to leave. <laughs> yeah. It's not, so, home. it's not home. Yeah. I, I don't know if I, uh, yeah. I Nothing against Finland. I mean, I just, I, it's, it's a place I like to go on vacation and it's been fun playing there. And, you know, the last time I was there and was in 2019 and I was able to, you know, hang out with, you know, my friend from, from nest and I hung out with, with Tonelli Jarva and, mm. you know, so yeah, it's, it's a cool place. Yeah. So growing up in Montana, um, you know, I mean, like, did you like, did you like do any kind of recreation or were you more of kind of just the type of person that just kind of appreciates, you know, being out in the wilderness and, you know, or did you do things, <clears throat> or did you do things that like really got you into it, which further kind of influenced you in songwriting? Well, so I'm originally from Washington state. I was, hmm. I was born in Ellensburg, Washington. I, I spent my childhood between Oak Harbor and Rochester Spent a lot of time in Seattle, a lot of time kind of in Portland. Um, so I'm actually more of a Northwest guy, actually. My But after Mount St. Helens went off, my family was like, fuck this place. <laughs> Let's go somewhere else where they don't have volcanoes and lots of rain. And so my my mom got a job in, in Montana. So we moved there in like, I think it was 82. <clears throat> and I was there until 94 when I graduated from high school. And then I moved back to Seattle, I, you know, and then... I, aside from a short stint in New Hampshire, out of curiosity, I've lived in the Northwest ever since 90, 98, basically. <clears throat> so, but Montana, you know, my memories of Montana, yeah, I love, that's, I, obviously that's where, you know, I got into music. That's when I, that's basically where, where I grew up. You know, I went to school there. I got into music there. I, I actually I did a lot of things when I was a kid. I raced motocross when I was a kid. I I would always go snowmobiling with my dad, and you know that's where I got to see a lot of like the wilderness and and get a taste for like the the especially the winter, and um, and also like ghost towns and like the old west aesthetic. I, yeah, that's that's, that's where the it, place where it got me. Yeah. So yeah, um, but yeah, so. When I did left, you, Montana, did you start I, Agaloc there? Or were you over no, in Oregon? You, you no, were in was, Oregon then. I was in Seattle. Oh, you were in Seattle. <laughs> yeah. I, so I went to school in Seattle. I went to college in Seattle. Okay. And, and I was there for a couple of years before I before I moved to New Hampshire and then moved back. Then I moved down to Oregon. Um, but yeah, so I started Agaloc when I was in Seattle, 
Jason was, Jason, so I was in, in contact with Jason in, and he was in Montana at the time. And so was Shane Brayer. Mm-hmm. And Shane Brayer was an old tape trader friend of mine. And of course I'd known Jason since 92 because he is, was born and raised in Montana. He's from Bozeman. I was, I lived in Butte mm-hmm. and I met Jason at a Hastings um, just randomly basically. And, you know, it was, it was a weird kind of meeting because it's like, you know, there aren't many death metal people in Montana. Really. Yeah, right. <laughs> I was, sure. the, I was the guy, there was this other guy in, in high school who was kind of a death thrash guy and he hated me. So it was me. Yeah. A couple, <laughs> I, a couple of weirdos, right? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. Um, no, I didn't start Agalock in Montana. Okay. But, I was thinking but, I read that and that, you know, it's, it's just one of those things, but um, I think, I think, I was very influenced by the wilderness of Montana while I was in Seattle, you know, cause I, you know, you don't, you don't realize what you have and, and what, you, you know, until it's gone until you're yeah, right. And so when I was in Seattle, I kind of missed the winter and the wilderness of Montana and writing music in that style. Keep in mind, this was the, this was like 95. So I was just getting into stuff like in the woods and Oliver, and those kind of bands yeah. around that time. And it was remind and that music reminded me of, of Montana. And wow. so the music that I wanted to start playing at that time, I wanted to evoke those woods, those snowy woods. And so yeah, so yeah, it started I, I was in Mont- I was in Seattle, but it was influenced by Montana. Yeah. <clears throat> Something to be said for like, you know, like you said, like you sort of maybe gave you like a yearning for being back there in your mind. It's like, there's something about being in a place and like leaving it, but you never really kind of left it. It's always kind of like this view is still kind of there. It's kind of how I think about places like that. The first time I went to Yellowstone, I felt like I was kind of like, I didn't want to leave because I had such like a profound experience. Yeah. Like, and, I, and then when I left, I was like so depressed. And then I realized that I kind of took it back with me and it was kind of a good thing. You know what I mean? Right. And you, you know, know, the that- thing, the thing about, I discovered you guys in 2002 with the mantle. I read, I want to say I read a a review in Brave Words, probably, probably. I'm thinking that's where I saw it. But I was already a DN guy because Opeth was doing stuff there. And I kind of, I knew about death metal. I'm a little bit older than you guys. I'm pushing 58. So I, I, you know, I came from the 70s. Rush is, (laughs) Rush are my gods. Nobody too. Nobody touches that band. I'm sorry. Yeah, I agree. Um, and 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 I got to meet Getty and Alex. And uh, besides, the, besides the birth of my kids, there's never been a more profound 30 seconds of my life. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I really wanted to catch his book tour in Seattle. But, I yeah. I was gonna go. Did you? I don't know about you. Did you look into it? Because the the tickets were absurd. Yeah, exactly. Like Two hundred and fifty dollars. I'm like. Right. I don't want to see Getty that bad. I just don't, I don't have that kind of money to blow on that. So, but I did get to meet him on the snakes and arrow tour. But, but my point was that I knew about the first wave black metal. I knew about mayhem. I knew about, uh, you know, uh, enslaved and um, immortal and those bands. And I just, I just couldn't get my head around it at the time. Just like I couldn't get my head around death metal at first. I love the music. I just couldn't get into the vocals. But what happened was, and this is where you guys come in profoundly, is that I took a chance on the mantle and it just changed my whole perspective about, and I know you don't exclusively think of yourself as a, you guys don't think of yourself as just a black metal band. It's a component of, of everything. I know you like you, you've in the past called yourself dark metal, which is a a good, a good uh, descriptor because You've got post metal. You've got some Joy Division-y fields of Nephilim. You've got, you know, um, you know all, all that kind of influence, Depeche Mode and Tangerine Dream and all kind of really cool stuff, right? But it was really getting into these long, expansive post metal tracks that had clean and raspy black metal vocals that kind of turned my my head into thinking, well, I need to go back and and check out bands like the early immortal and like mayhem i'm still not a huge man fan i'm not gonna lie i just they it doesn't click for me for some reason but enslaved one of my absolute favorite bands probably my other other than you guys probably my second or first favorite of that 
ilk of bands. But I think the one thing that sets you guys apart, John, always is that you distinctly sound American. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I, I, I think it's a good thing in that there's an Americana, sort of a gothic sort of vibe to your music. And I wanted to ask you, are you familiar with 16 Horsepower? Oh, yeah. Okay, I, I hear 16 Horsepower at times interwoven, and they precede you by a little bit. And one of my absolute favorite bands that a lot of people just don't know about, they might know about D, D now, David Eugene Edwards now, or they may know, know about Woven Hand, but man, those early fucking 16 Horsepower albums floor me. all the, Every time I go back to them, I'm like, fuck, this shit's wicked. It's evil sounding, right? Yeah. Um, I, I can't say that it was influence on us. Um, I heard 16 Horsepower years after. I mean, I think I first heard 16 Horsepower in maybe 2010. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, I would say that that would probably be more of an influence on my solo stuff than, than Agalock. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I was curious about that because I, I, do you hear it at all or is that not – does that not register where I'm coming from on that? I mean, I mean, maybe there's, I don't know, maybe they, I don't know who, who their influences are, but maybe somewhere along the line where we have a, a mutual influence that, mm -hmm. you know, it's maybe that nexus of sort of the, yeah. the Gothic sort of kind of revivalist sort of vibe. Yeah. That, yeah. That you sometimes have in, <laughs> even in Aglock, I hear it not directly. Not, it's not like you suddenly are doing hoedowns or that kind of shit like that. It's just sort of a, an ambience sort of feel, right? And I just was curious about that, well, you know. We're we're very influenced by spaghetti westerns, even in Agalog. Or I mean, Comey, right, exactly. You hear it on you hear it on the the on Shadow. There's mm -hmm. Don and I even in the studio said, okay, here comes the Morricone part. Okay. You know, so maybe that's maybe that's the mutual influence that we have. That that's probably it right there. I think you just nailed it. Yeah, exactly. And I, I want to bring up I'm sorry, I have that same that same lineage is with Sol the band Solstafir, you know. Oh, yeah. You know, they love spaghetti westerns and they love Fields and Nephilim. And I'm like, so do we. <laughs> well, and then there's and then there's the, de the Death in June sort of yeah. vibe. You've yeah. covered them. And there's they have a little bit of a weird sort of Joy Division-y, 16 horsepower sort of vibe to them as well. That, you know, and it's, it's kind of hard to explain. Dead Can Dance is another one where I hear some... Oh yeah, kind of convoluted sort Definitely. of things there. That yeah, and of course, one of your favorite bands, and absolutely one of my favorite art bands of all time, Talk Talk. I oh, mean, dude. you know, there's those <laughs> albums. That, I'm that's I a religion. That's not a band. <laughs> What's that? That's a religion. That's not a band. It is a religion, <laughs> exactly. And you know, the funny thing is, like a lot of people, and I'm sure we could point to, you know, Laughing Stock and oh. Color of Spring and all that stuff. But mm -hmm. you know what, dude? I fucking love the first album. I think it's the most brilliant synth pop album maybe yeah. ever made. It's just a yeah. And I think some of their best early stuff was never released on their albums. Like uh, the guys. song Yeah, like the song My Foolish Friend. Oh. What a brilliant song. Why did what why was that never on It's My Life? You know, it make, makes no, no question, sense. no question. A sides, B sides, man. You got to get that comp. I have right? it. I have it. No, I'm just saying to anybody watching, you got oh. it. You take anything away from this talking about talk talk right now get and i've done a three and a half hour talk talk deep dive by myself essentially because i love that band so much if we'd have been talking i'd have been like john come come join me please but um, i could talk for three hours just about the song new grass ah <laughs> ah dude it's just insane do you know i did bring up stephen wilson i'm sure you know porcupine tree yeah i think yeah are you familiar with steve's other major project no man no, I don't really follow his stuff really. All right, John, you you got it. When we end here, I, if you trust me, give me your your email, and I'm gonna send you some stuff. You must 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 check out. It's so it's so influenced by that late period talk talk. It's mind blowing. So um, cool. yeah um, Jimmy, what else did you have there? I think you had another one in there. Quick, John, how are you on time? I'm fine. Okay, another 15 minutes or so. Or half hour, it doesn't matter. All right, cool, cool. Go ahead, John. Well, you didn't get to finish telling us about, uh, but right before Don left, um, it was about uh, your guys' stage performance, or actually your 
sort of like willingness to like what was it jeff like a willingness to come like come on like a stream like this or just like kind of do interviews and things like that he was gonna oh, you said you were gonna tell us a story where yeah, i mentioned yeah, that yeah. i was concerned you might not come on or you wouldn't be interested or whatever yeah so for the longest time i was always the guy in the band that would just i'd go out there i'd play the show and then i'd go backstage and eventually after a while i i would be the guy that would just go backstage and drink <laughs> all night ah, yeah. but but even so, even before that era, I just would, I just didn't like to hobnob with people. I was tired. I had just played a show. I don't really want to talk to people. My voice is shot. I would just chill backstage while they're out talking to fans. And, I, you know, and it kind of became a thing where it's like I had this reputation, I guess, yeah. similar to Neil Pert, where it's like, oh, he's just, you know, he doesn't like his fans. or but It's not true at all. I just, I, I, I'm a very introverted person. I'm very... I like to be in my own head and I feel like hobnobbing with a bunch of people is really, eh, it's just not interesting to me, especially, especially before a show. But I mean, even after a show, it's just like, ugh. thank you for showing up, but I just need to chill, you know, but the one thing that was weird is so at the Portland show, um, Hunter and I went to that record store across the street Don was talking about and we you know and we were coming back and I had parked my car right in front of the venue so I was putting my my stuff in my car and there was a line because the show the stores haven't start hadn't opened yet mm -hmm. and so you know I signed a couple of autographs and then I just decided fuck it I'm just going to stand in the rain with the crowd in line and talk to these people because I've never done that before and it's it seems like it would be a, a nice thing to do and it ended up being very rewarding and I'll probably do that more and more now because it's, I, it's not like I'm an arrogant person. I just, I just don't know what to say to people, you know, and it's, it's awkward. I to, was going to say, it can get a little weird when everybody's coming up to you going, Oh my God. Exactly. You know? Because exactly. It, it can make you feel a little, I've had it as a result of doing this, John, where I've, okay. I was at decibel fest and like people were tapping me on the show. I, it wasn't a lot, maybe seven people like, dude, I know you from YouTube. I'm like, chill. What's up, man? You like the show? Good. I'm a very personable, very chatty, very, but even I was kind of like, all right, just don't be weird. You know, like, don't be a fucking weirdo because I don't want to have to be the guy that goes, bro, ch you know, chill. You're like in my, you're in my space. Cause some people don't have a good read on personal space and things like that. And so I can understand, especially, especially before a gig where you don't want to be completely drained by all this energy you have to expel to or expend to kind of be the, the nice guy and be the, the good guy. Right. And also, you know, especially like if you're in a venue and the, and the opening bands playing, I can't be yelling at people talking back and forth, my voice and all that yeah. stuff. I'm going to save my voice. I got to, yep. I just, I need to chill before a show. And then after a show, I also need to chill. <laughs> Because well, we would play for two hours, you know? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> I do think, if you allow me to do this, and you can tell me to fuck off. I don't, I don't, I mean, you certainly. But I do think, I, I do want to bring up just the importance of, for bands yeah. at your level that are not fucking Kiss or they're not Judas Priest or Metallica, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The connection with the fans is the most important thing that you, and you know this, I'm not telling yeah. you anything you don't, you're not fully aware of. It's the most important thing you can have other than the performance itself. And so I, I will tell you straight up right now, being fully uh, transparent, I'm stoked. I was so stoked you were coming on. Not because I'm weird and I have some weird fantasy thing like, oh, my God, it's John Holm. Oh, my God. It's nothing like that at all. It's just like, man, I like connecting with people that I have these things in common with in musical bonds terms right but at the end of the day we're all the same we're just right. music fans you know we're nerds I mean, that's really what we're, it is. we're music nerds right yeah yeah we're gear nerds we're new your music nerds we're you know it's but not I think like it's, i think it's super cool that you did that in portland and that maybe it kind of opened up a little bit of a a door for you to kind of go okay i may not do this every single time for 45 minutes or a half an hour or whatever. And I do have to watch the yeah. physical aspect because a lot of people do not understand that generally, if you're just the guitar player or you're just the drummer 
or the bass player, not to minimize those guys, but your instrument's right here. You Your instrument's right here and right here, the thing you have in your hands. When you are a vocalist, man, it is so physical. It is so yeah. taxing for you entirely. Plus, you're the lead guy in terms of a lot of the focal points. It takes probably takes a lot out of you. So, you know, makes sense, right? Well, I mean, I also perform with a bit of a wall around me, like a mental wall. Um, Don Don really likes to get in there with the with the crowd. Right. And he he hates like whenever there's like a big venue with a photo pit. He hates that. Right, because it's that separation. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> because like it creates a bit, barrier right? between me and that, and that that I yeah. can like kind of be in my world. So, and you know what that probably is? Just playing armchair psychologist here a little bit. That is probably the way you cope with anxiety that you don't, you're not even fully aware of. In other words, it's kind of like, okay, I have that little buffer zone. I don't have to be right like this and and be so my space doesn't have to be invaded by, by these people that I don't really know, you know? Yeah. I mean, but on the other hand, I also did something I'd never done before at the prophecy fest was at the end of the, at the very end of the set, we finished, I guess it was bloodbirds and um, Don did his thing where he jumped into the photo pit and he started shaking hands with people and everything else. And I was like, man, I'll do the same. And I did. And people were wow. surprised. <laughs> But it was so fun. It was rewarding. Did it, shock, did it shock you you did that? Yeah. But it was such a spontaneous thing. I was just nice. Like, I was just like, I'm feeling it. What what the hell? And then when I when I crawled back on the stage, I was like, Yeah, it was that that was great. I like that, you know. Nice, nice. Um, I wanted to ask you about a, a collaboration you did with a mutual buddy. I don't want to call him a buddy buddy, but we've done a long three hour interview. I'm I'm known for these crazy long interviews. Um, Daniel Menchi. Oh, you know Daniel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we talked about the collaboration, and <laughs> uh, Daniel's such a sweetheart of a guy. He's a little airheady, you know, like he's a little bit a little. scattershot. <laughs> and he admits that. He told me that before we yeah. even did the interview. He's like, look, man, I, I'm very scattershot. I'm like, I'm ADHD myself, so don't worry about it. I'll keep you, I'll keep you locked in. I, I kind of am a drill sergeant on these interviews, and – I got into him with Field of Skin going way back. And then I'm a huge Andrew Lyles fan. I don't know if you know Andrew Lyles. No. You got to check out Andrew Lyles. I'll, I'll get some links to him, too. He's the one that he and I wrote the intro track. If you paid any attention to the intro track. Okay. The kind of new wave of British heavy metal thing with my voiceover. Mm -hmm. I gave him some chords and said, do something with this. Because I don't have a way to record right now because of some medical stuff I'm going through and finances. And he's like, hey, mate. A day later, he comes back with that track. I'm like, dude, this rips. It's like perfect. But him and and Daniel did a Progeny of Flies, which is their their uh, Nexus point, which I think came out on Beta Lactum, I believe. Yeah, that's yeah. a local label. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Are they still around? I don't think they're around now. Probably not. Yeah. Um. Or it might have been Solo Moon. I'm not sure. But... Oh, they're still around. Yeah, I know Solo Moon Moon is <laughs> and um um. So Daniel and I talked about your collab um, and uh, he says to me after we got done, he's like, by the way, I have a, a bunch of copies of that. I don't know. Is it a CD or is it vinyl? It's vinyl and CD. Okay. He, I think he has some left over basement. He said, I'm like, dude, yeah. quit bogarting them. Get me one of those. I'll pay you for them. Yeah, I'm still got like 10 of them left i'm still waiting for one to show up so i have yeah. to you know whether it's going to come from him or whether i buy it from you i'll do that um talk about that a little bit like how'd that come about you reach him out to him we well you know daniel and i and i and actually with agalot goes they he goes back with us a long time as well um he actually drove our van on our 2011 tour well, i didn't know that he didn't yeah. mention that yeah and in fact when we were in new york city he was doing our mat or our merch as oh. well as driving our van. <laughs> Maybe he did say that now that I'm thinking, I forget I've done so many of these. And there was someone that was giving Jason a bad time about it. He was just like, what, who does, who do you think you are having Daniel Menchie do your merch? And we're like, man, <laughs> it's a friend of ours, whatever. <laughs> but yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we had talked about, you know, I like, I love his stuff and, I, I just, I brought it up to him. I was like, Hey, would you like to do a collab? And, you know, I kind of explained to him kind of what I had in mind and mm -hmm. uh, 
Yeah. And we went out to Silver Falls and we, we got the samples and we went to, there's a monastery that's on the way to Silver Falls and he sampled the bell that ended up being the bell tone, which is the yeah. version of Super it. Super cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, I mean, it's very, um, <clears throat> Daniel's crazy pro prolific almost to a fault. You almost yeah. cannot keep up with what he's yeah. doing because I think his mind is always on the next sort of thing that he can create. Right. And him and him and I used to go hiking a lot and he would uh -huh. be out there with his recorder, like recording a train or recording yeah. birds or, you know, yeah. And that's cool, man. That's the, to me, that's the essence of creativity. You are always, you've always got something going on. And let's be honest. A lot of us as creative as I can be, I'm lazy way, way too much. I'm, I'm like, eh, I just don't feel like doing it right now. I'm surfing the internet or I'm doing whatever. And, but Daniel seems to always kind of, the wheels always seem to be kind of turning to do something bizarre and strange. And yeah, my first ever solo performance was with Daniel. Really? Yeah, we, we did a dual show where it was like, I did my solo thing, and then we did a collaboration show together okay. that was set. And I don't know if you know this, but Daniel engineered um, The Last Place I Remember, my first solo record. I did not know that, no. Yeah. And he also, he recorded a lot of my live shows early on that I've released since. And I, I don't think he intimated that you guys were that close, so it's kind of interesting he that as far as like friendship yeah. wise yeah. during covid we kind of fell off a bit i do well, as, as we all did you know yeah but no i mean he he he'll sometimes go and and uh i don't know if the if the word work is is the right word but he'll he'll do he'll help out at this record store downtown called landfill rescue unit right so i'll sometimes you know He'll he'll post about it on Instagram. Oh, I'm I'm down at landfill today. Stop by, and I'll you know I'll see that, and I'll go hang out. Head down and hang out, yeah. yeah but you know, it's like Daniel's. He's 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 gotten kind of grumpy <laughs> in the last few years. Oh, really? You know, it's like I'll say to him, "Hey, we should play a show again," and he's like, "Ah, it's it's pointless to play shows." <laughs> I I got the sense from him when we interviewed that he 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 said to me that you know for him shows are these incredibly physical yeah, things that he are. just and he is he's kind of almost like insanely intense during live performances i mean it's him with these weird instruments that he's created that aren't really instruments at all and mm -hmm. tons of looping pedals and tons of delay pedals and it's very creative but it's not for everybody let's be honest it's not that yeah. kind of thing you know he he opened for Agalock in New York in 2011, and he terrified our audience. It was awesome. I that, I, I could see that. I could totally see it. Jimmy, you're not familiar, right? No, I don't think uh, so. We'll, we'll talk about it. Um, John, I've, you uh, uh, Oh yeah. Uh, one thing I've always I don't know why a documentary on him hasn't been made yet. There should be one because he's such a fascinatingly quirky guy, right? I mean, quirky. I, I would make it. If oh yeah, it's yeah, just yeah, like, yeah. I've got the time. And, then, and he's always the only thing he posts on his Instagram is pictures of his dog Arrow, who I don't even yeah. think can walk. He just it is blind. Oh, it's blind. Okay. Yeah. Did you see the one where he did right before Halloween, where he was skateboarding uh -huh. and uh -huh. he, was, he was singing? He was, mm -hmm. What was he singing? He was singing Glenn Danzig doing Careless Whisper, something like that. Yeah. I'm like, bro, blink twice if you need us to come and send help. Because <laughs> it's not right, right? No, um, he's always been that way. <laughs> yeah, just quirky and and strange. Yeah. And he's buddies. He he's done something with Andrew Lyles, who's done work with Stephen Wilson. Who do you know? Bass Communion. Do you know the drone side of Stephen Wilson Bass Communion? I've heard of it. Yeah, that's something you'd probably enjoy too. I was going to ask you too. Are you much in into uh, Brian Williams and L Lust Mord at all? I like Lust Mord. I love the the first album, Heresy. No, Heresy's fucking. That's not his first album. That's oh, his. Oh, second or third. The first one's just called Lust Mord. Um, very much more in the SPK vein. I love uh, SPK. Throbbing Gristle like, kind yeah. of weirdly out there. Um, well, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of SPK and Throbbing Gristle, and of course Coil. So. Oh, well, well, yeah, Coil. Oh man, uh, mm -hmm. you and I got to talk about Coil. We should do something together talking about Coil. But um, the um, I was going to ask you. I I I'd love to get you in touch with Brian, man, because. I think two, you two are very creative in that weird sort of twilight area of non-traditional 
music that you could mm-hmm. probably do something cool. He actually did some editing on that intro track for me, which was really for nothing. Just said, Hey, let me help you out. Cause I did a three hour interview with him. You see where this is going, right? Yeah. Um, but Jimmy, what else you got, man? Well, I mean, I was going to lead, lead into cast iron blood. I wanted to ask a little bit about that and, but you, know, you, brought it up. Um, you know, what I, what I know about the record other than, you know, than, than just listening to it is, you know, it's, you know, what is it about, uh, and maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, just the record itself, but uh, 1865 to 1895, what is it about those years that, um, you know, that you would title the record that way? You know, I told, and before you answer, I was going to say, going back to what I was asking you about that book, Blood and Thunder, that's very much in that time period. So, Well, those are sort of the, those are typically the renegade Old West years yeah. where there was lawlessness and, you know, so typically that time period was that, was that time when you, you, you know, all these movies are made in that, within that time period and stuff. So that, that's really why, where that came from, because, so the concept of this, of this particular thing, um, is this nomadic ghost who was hanged in 1899 and he's been wandering the, the, the meta, the metaphysical desert through all different time periods and stuff. And so anyway, so last place I remember, is kind of it's the first i'm doing a trilogy and the first last place i remember was the first album and that that part of the trilogy refers to the terrain the the harshness of the desert and you know all of that the textures of of that type of existence or whatever cast iron blood is the time period that this nomad lived in um between 1875 and 1899 the next and final album that i'm currently working on recording um, is going to be a funeral album about kind of about where, when he was hanged and became the nomadic ghost. So it cycles all the way around and I'm actually going to design it to where the last track on the third album kind of literally goes, starts or it ends the way that the first album begins. Is that, is that a real life character or is that something? It's just something I came up with. Yeah. I was driving through the desert on my way to Las Vegas one year and it just came to me, this idea of doing this project. And, and here's the other thing is like, so growing up in Montana, I was exposed to the old West aesthetic that I always loved. You know, I always loved going to the mining museum in Butte and I loved going to these ghost towns, you know, when we, when my dad and I would snowmobile and I, it just became part, it kind of was, it got under my skin, you know? And, um, Back then, this would have been like 92 when I had a, my high school band. We 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 thought about doing like kind of like a metal version of like this old West thing. It just didn't work. We I didn't have the maturity to do it. it. I guess I guess Wayfarer is kind of a band nowadays that's kind of doing that. Well, and and, and Fields. Let's be and, honest. Well, I mean, Fields Fields is more like they're the OG, uh, but they've got the the um the 80s vibe to them, right? They've got yeah, that. but they well, weren't metal. I mean, yeah, you know, mm-hmm. but Wayfair, absolutely. You know, I mean, and I get it. And I, get, and I, you know, I, I've met a couple of those guys because I think they play in Blood, Blood Incantation. And I've, Isaac and Florian, does, yeah. Florian Isaac. played with Blood Incantation. And, and, oh, okay. And so um, I think it's Isaac. I think he's a, Isaac's Isaac. a drummer. Yeah, he's a drummer. Yeah. 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 So, you know, and I get where they're coming from, where their influences are coming from, being from Colorado. And it's very similar to my influences coming from Montana. Yeah. So, I mean, we're all kind of brothers of the, of the old West in a, in a way. Yeah. And um, if I ever have a chance, I'd love to talk to those guys, talk to those guys about that. Cause they're again, doing a really, they're doing a killer job at, at recreating that aesthetic in the yep. same way that the soul sphere is that I am, you know, it's not hokey the way they're doing it. And I, and I really, I think that's really cool. And it's yeah, all, there's it's another cool. band called vital spirit. That's kind of doing a similar thing from mm. Vancouver. And they're kind of like Wayfarer, but I mean, and and if you read their liner notes, they're all, it's all Corbin McCarthy, yeah, uh, Kit Carson, Hampton yep. Side, who I was just telling you about. It's all based on that kind of stuff and kind of and similar. See, and see, on top of all that, you know, so I've got Montana, I've got Cormac McCarthy, I've also got you know Phil's and Ephlam, and I've got Dead Man, the movie from Jar- Jim Jarmusch, Johnny, Je- Johnny Depp, and yeah. That, and that movie was a huge influence on me. It was Neil Young, right? Neil Young? Huh? Neil, Neil Young, Young right? Yeah. The soundtrack. And I'm a huge Neil Young fan. Dude, that fucking, oh, it's so oh. fucking good, man. And so I remember watching that movie one time thinking, I would love to do something that takes this kind of soundtrack, but does more with it. 
And that's kind of what Cast Iron Blood became. A little bit more of a metallic influence, maybe under curdling underneath a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, maybe like like the little touches of the of the Ennio Marconi stuff that Agalock had on the mantle. Mm -hmm. I just expanded on that. I just took that little bit and made a whole record of that type of stuff. Yeah, and that I mean, you, you said it there. The the Morricone stuff is just so it's so evocative, right? It just has that. Absolutely. It's that thing where you can literally in your mind see the cinemas of the or the mm -hmm. cinematic views of the deserts and the buttes and the skyline and the <laughs> sweltering sun and the cold nights with the fires and yeah, very very cool. And see, I wanted and to ask that, you, I and all of that you, stuff I wanted to to evoke with that project. I wanted to ask you about this. Do you, do you still have those left? Oh yeah, I've got about I think thirty left. I got to ask, there's no plans to ever do a CD version of that though, right? No. It has no. to be a tape. See, I'm 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 going to come up as a poser here, but I'm just not a tape guy. Well, I, yeah. It was just a for me it was just an art piece. Yeah. Put it in that wooden box with the etching on it and it's just I'm going to grab just, one just to have one, but I I <clears throat> it's one of those things I don't even have a tape player. So it would be like, you know, what am I going to I doubt I'll buy one. It has a download card. <laughs> Oh, does it? Oh, okay, yeah. well, there you go. All right, well then. Yeah, then like, they had, like just like they had in the 1860s. <laughs> of course, they had download cards in the 1860s. Of course, right. Um, I see you're a wine drinker. Do you have any favorite wines that you uh, partake in? Um, not really. I just like. As long as it's I, red, right? I, I like really dark wine. I like black wines. Those are my favorites. I, I as far as any particular brand, no. Okay. As long as it tastes good. <laughs> Are you, Sorry. um, we were talking about Halloween. I'm going to move my, you a fan? I'm sure you're a fan, right? Well, it's funny. Have you heard the, uh, sculptured cover of Suspiria? No, I haven't. I oh, played wait. drums on it. No, wait, I did. Yes, yes. I did hear it way back. Yes, yes. Yeah. I play drums on that. Oh, really? Yeah. I think I knew that, but I, it's been, I'm far enough away from it. I probably forgot. It was um, recorded when we did uh, Apollo Ends. Okay. Because I played on that album. Right. Let me ask you this. Um, there was a, I'm going to ask a tough question here, okay? Don's not here, but I, I, this is one I've been thinking about. So when I was talking to Don uh, back almost a year ago now, one of the things that we brought up was kind of how the band ended. Do you, can you speak to that a little bit as far as like the relationship thing and how you guys healed all that? Is it, is it something you're comfortable talking about or are you not comfortable to talking about? To an extent. About? I mean, I think it's been talked about already, but we can, yeah, we can get into it a little bit. Well, just give me an idea of like, I mean, we don't have to get into what was said because I, I got to be honest with you, I don't even know. I, I've never seen it, so I don't know. So we don't have to try that ground. I'm just curious about how interpersonal relationship wise, how that affected all parties from your perspective and how you seemingly from what i understand did what you needed to do to rectify that i guess um so okay uh do you want to go all the way back to before that happened like before yeah yeah i'm curious do you, you okay with this yeah yeah uh so on that last european tour we did you know well actually no going back to even before serpent was recorded i we were just not getting along we were just i don't I, you know when a band is locked in and they all see eye to eye. It's a marriage. It's a, it's 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 perfect. And we had started to splinter off. And you know, it was it was a mixture of things in our lives and just things that we wanted the band to be in the future. And I wanted to go in a more aggressive uh, direction after Serpent. They wanted to go more progressive. Some of the ideas that Don had, quite frankly, made me cringe. <laughs> okay. Um, and so I was just like, you know, we're just, we're not in a, we're not on the same page anymore. And I just, I, I was just, and, and, you know, they kept turning down tours and turning down opportunities. And I really wanted to play more. I wanted to tour more. I wanted, you know, I wanted to do basically what I did with Pelorian. You but know? you understood though, that Don had a I professional did. career and it I was, did. Much Absolutely. harder for him to do than for you, yeah. right? Obviously, right? Yeah, so, yeah. But I mean, you know, and we'd often pass. We'd actually, I'd actually said, "Hey, could we if we if we do this other tour and you can't do it, can we have like a stand-in?" And that was like blasphemy. Oh know? yeah, yeah. You know, so you know, we had talked. There had been there had been a lot of discussions, but 
at the end of the day, I just, and you also have to realize that I was mentally fucked by that point. I was, I was an alcoholic. I was stressed out by everything. And I felt like it, all of it was on my shoulders because at the time it kind of was, I did the business stuff. I worked with the labels. I, I helped book the tours. I, you know, it was, it was your was full-time a, job. It was basically a full-time job yeah, where right. I wasn't, you know, it, I didn't feel compensated <laughs> and I just got tired of it. And I got really burned out by that, by what the band had started to become. And so I just decided to end it. And there was a lot of misinformation that was brought on by certain parties and that went to yeah, the I, I think I know what you're talking about. And it just became this mess. You know, all I wanted to do was, was play music and do it more full time. And what, what I regret is that we just didn't put it on hold. You know, we could have just gone on hiatus and I could have done my thing. And then years later, we could have come back together and, continued or not it could have been a mike portnoy story right <laughs> yeah basically and that's kind of what's going on it's kind of what's going on now except we're not i feel like we're ba we're back on the same page because to be honest Polorian burned me out um it it made all of my mental issues worse mm -hmm. it, it it made my alcoholism worse it was a band that was just fueled by hatred and anger and all of that negativity and it yeah. eventually just ate the band up. I mean, by the time we split, by the time that band split up, we were already kind of hating each other as well. Right, right, right. <laughs> well, it was really easy for them to walk away when I was a dumbass online. And uh, so, yeah, that's, that's really what it boiled down to. How did to. you end up bringing it back together then? Did you reach out or um, how did that occur? Well, actually that nonsense online that split up Polorian actually brought Don to reach out to me and say, Hey man, we got to talk. You, you don't seem okay. And I wasn't, I was not okay. And so we met at the horse brass. I was, I was going to, I, as I, I actually had planned a trip to Europe just to get the fuck out of, out of Dodge for a while. Mm -hmm. right. And um, right before I left for that trip, we met at the horse brass and we hashed things out. And I think a lot of, a lot of the misinformation had been smoothed out. You know, it's like he didn't realize there was a lot of stuff he didn't realize that was going on with me. He didn't. There was a lot of stuff that was that was purely misinformation online from the press and stuff that boiled over. And we worked it all out. I apologized for being the way I was, you know, and it and we just and it was like, it was almost like at the end of the day, at the end of that meeting, it was like everything magically was gone. You know, yeah, when we talked to him, I think the one thing, if I <clears throat> and I'm paraphrasing here because I don't remember exactly how he said it, but he said that you know, he, he said he got a little teary eyed and he said it was just good to have the friendship back that meant yeah. more than the yeah. business end of the thing because he did mention the fact that because Agaloc was is a small business, you guys had to occasionally connect, anyways, throughout those years to kind yeah. of discuss reissues and, and things of that nature and so i was just curious how it kind of worked for you on your end as far as that reconnection thing well i mean it, it was like a divorce where you have kids you know you still have to you know work together in some small way and and we we would email business stuff and eventually it it it, it became more casual where we were just saying, you know, Hey, what are you up, up to, up to these days, that type of thing. And then, mm -hmm. yeah, but it was, you know, we, we'd never agreed to meet or anything. I'd never thought, I didn't think I'd ever speak to those or meet, see those guys again. No kidding. Um, especially Jason. Uh, Jason really had beef with me. Um, Aesop of course had beef with me. Uh, but Don, you know, Don and I, I don't know. I think Don's always been a very, smooth operator he's been more open-minded yeah about, you know forgiveness or whatever um and i had come to a point where i crashed and burned so i was basically picking up the pieces of my own life and it was a good time for us to sort of reconnect and yeah that's you that's don't you don't speak with asap right um no not really but i 
I did run into him at the Sabretooth Festival in September. Um, and we, we talked for a while and it was kind of similar to the Don thing. It's like, he was like, yeah, I was going through some shit. I was, I was an alcoholic. I was mentally unwell. And I was like, me too. And, (laughs) and, you know, I mean, he's not, I wouldn't say I was never that close with Aesop, even during Agaloc. Um, he just, he, him, our personalities were just not right. He was more, he was closer with the other guys. Um, but you know, so I I don't think that Aesop has a bad word to say about me anymore. Is that's all good. I, that's yeah. good. Um, Jimmy, and vice versa. I, I I did want to touch on this, and I, I guess we we let Don go before I I got to this last big one. What's the what's the long range forecast uh, say for Agaloc? Is it Simply, we're going to do some gigs, and we'll see what happens. Or is there any discussion about doing new material? I know that's one of those things. It's like, oh, don't do, don't go there. But you know, it's an obvious question. Would would there be a chance for a new Agaloc album, or is that just <clears throat> whatever happens happens? Well, yeah, that. Uh, uh, you know, that's a that's a loaded question because you know I love making records. You know, and when things are good and we have the inspiration, you know, maybe I'm not, I'm not going to say never because I've already done that. And I look Mm -hmm. like when I, when we, when we played prophecy fest. Um, But at the same time, it's just like, you know, does the world really need another Agalock album? I don't know. Uh, Depends on who you ask. Probably. Yeah. I mean, I kind (laughs) of feel like in one, in one way it would be kind of tarnishing the legacy that we already have. If we, if we pulled, say, a morbid angel, <laughs> yeah, oh, <laughs> you know, because yeah. that's that's the thing, man. It's like we, you know, obviously we're a band that doesn't give a fuck what people think of us in terms of what we do, mm-hmm. but that can also be a double edged sword because you can do something that can really tarnish your your legacy. Um, Let me just throw something at you here. So, I lost touch with the band, in all honesty, before the final album, before you guys split up. And I really wasn't paying attention. That's why I didn't really know and truthfully don't know about the things that were said. I I don't really know. I honestly don't. Um, And I wasn't really tapped into social media around then. I had a lot going on like you. I had some issues and young teenagers that were graduating high school and just graduated school because my kids are actually pushing 30 already. And so I had to, to do that deep dive, John. I had to go back and listen to the Serpent album because I didn't know. I knew about it, but I never, ever checked it out. Damn, dude, it's a fucking killer album. It's a little bit more of a metal album to me, a little bit more of a dark, heavy doom metal album. And I think it's killer. So I think I think we didn't go far enough with the concept looking back on it. I mean, I think it's a fine record. It's more of a progressive rock album than it is a metal album, in my opinion. Uh, but I think that, you know, we should have gone further with, with the modular synthesizer, synthesizer stuff, for, first of all. And I, I don't know. I, I think, I think it was a, a great album that had a lot of potential that slightly fell flat because we just didn't, we, I think we played it a little too safe. Were, was everybody's hearts in it or were you the main driving force at that time? No, we were kind of not. We were not on the same page once again. Okay. I mean, we, we were on the same page enough to make it happen. Right. But, you know, and that album was also written in a very different way. It was written more like Faustine Echoes, where we just went into the rehearsal room and, and hashed out riffs. Hashed it out. Okay. Whereas before it was like, I would write the songs and then they would add their parts to it. And then we'd kind of work it out in the studio. Okay. That was an album where we we went into the studio and we played it live in the studio you know, not even so without you were, you were literally live jamming live these tracks studio. and developing them. Yeah, yeah. It, we recorded it multi-track. You know, which is a very different way than you sitting down or Don sitting down and tracking out all your guitars yeah. and going, "Okay, here's the the well, drum stuff." You know. Yeah, we did the basic tracks that way. We we did the basic tracks where we all sat down and we just played them, and then we went and did the layering afterwards. Okay. <clears throat> well, it's, it's funny because. Uh, my buddy Tyler is in here and he said, um, I, I got to look here. You can see it on the screen. Their expectations would be sky high. 
so sky high that it would be easy to fail in the fans' eyes. That's a tough call. But and I agree with that. But you know, as an artist, if you're yeah. making a if you're making an album for yeah. the fans, you're already doing it for the wrong reason. Exactly. Exactly. So you have to be sitting down going, this is material that I get excited about. And right. Right. then if it excites you, your hope is when you release it out into the world, somebody else gets excited. And I just had Damon Johnson from Brother Kane on uh, Tuesday. And I didn't, I don't know if you know that band, probably not your thing, but a great killer alternative heavy hard rock band, a little bit of a bluesy rock edge, Leonard Skinner, the edge. And I hadn't, kept up with what he was doing but they're coming locally to a club on saturday night and i thought you know i'm going to promote this thing because i love that band long story short i didn't know he was doing solo albums and his latest solo album 21 i found perhaps one of his best songs ever and when we're talking about it we get to the end and i'm like damon by the way i want to talk to you about shadow country his face just lit up like a fucking christmas tree he's like dude and because I just said, dude, that song kicks my ass. I listened to it 20 times in a row yesterday. And he's like, dude, nothing could endear you more than to hear you talk about Shadow Country. You are my favorite new fan, new old fan. I'm like, not that, man. But uh, you get what I'm saying. My point mm -hmm. of this is that he's writing songs for him. And me as yeah. a 30-year fan of his, discovering a new song is like, it was like fucking like I discovered, you know, I don't know, $500 in my wallet that it wasn't there before, you know? And it, so I guess what I'm trying to say is, John, if you guys find the spirit, the muse, so to speak, why not do it? Because who the fuck well, yeah. And that's And that's really, okay, this is how we've always done it anyway. I mean, you know, if you think about it, every album that we did, we would wash away the past and we would just do our thing. And if people liked it, great but you know we would never our expectation we always did things with the expectation that it was gonna fail but okay we we're having fun with it so fuck it who cares you know that's that's for the label to worry about not us <laughs> and Ro Rowan, uh, rowan's got a funny one He's, he says i want agalox rain chaos oh god <laughs> rain chaos is a great record a lot of people love it i don't I like mind it, it. i it's not storm it's not no. <laughs> you know but what is what i mean even the first what? album, I'm forgetting the fucking name. Somberlane. Thank you. Somberlane isn't the the storm. It's close, but I don't mind rain cast. I think it takes. I think it takes it on the chin a lot. But um, but well, yeah, I, I, I yeah. don't know, man. I mean, you know, I th I get what Tyler's saying, and he's not wrong. Well, um, yeah, and and that's the thing is that's why every Agalock album sounded unique because we would always just approach it with okay what are we where are we at right now as as artists as fans of music what what are we what do we want to do because the, the the foundation was always consistent it was we're a dark metal band at our core but what are we going to put on top of it to make this album interesting and that's really you know if we can come back to a place where we all agree on a on a concept that would be interesting then sure why not and if if we're happy with it that's what really matters because we're the we're the people that we have to impress the most because we have to live with it for the rest of right. our life. Right. And again, it goes back to that whole thing, man. If you're making music to please your fan base, you're in trouble. You're already fucked up. You're in trouble. I mean, yeah. a great example of that is Gary Newman, man. He creates this amazing new uh, you know, electronic sort of thing that influenced all those 80s artists, mm -hmm. two way and Pleasure Principle and Telecon and all that stuff. And then he can't reproduce the big giant hit to compete with cars. And what's he start doing? He does Warriors and Fury and just not good albums, man. And he admits that. He's like, I was trying mm -hmm. to listen to people around me tell me, you need to write the next cars again. And I wasn't doing it. And I was falling further into the influence of people that were telling me what to make. And then, realistically, I mean, if we don't have Gary Newman, we don't. I don't think we have Nine Inch Nails. That's no. just my or Skinny Puppy fans like that. Oh, definitely not Skinny Puppy. Yeah. But but yeah, what happens is Gary comes back and does Exile and Pure and these Splinter and these killer fucking albums that are just amazing the last 10, 15 years, mm -hmm. and he's rediscovered and reinvigorated his career. So. Um, they, uh, John, and we'll get you out of here in a couple minutes, John. Um, 
the thing you wanted to ask uh, Jimmy about um, Kurt, Kern Metal, the thing you asked Don, go and ask John those. I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to make a comment that, I mean, I probably most fans that really like the music probably appreciate that the most is they'd probably rather not anything unless it was something that really came from, you know, somewhere. I mean, it's kind of goes back to like the whole emperor thing, right? Like they still play live and they haven't released a record in like in 20 years or something, you know, that's but a good point. Like, and they're not going to, I mean, he's always said, said that, you know, it's, why am I going to come out and do another emperor record when I'm not even that person anymore? You know, not to say that that's, yeah. what doing, but, you know, but he's not even that guy. I mean, it was that's Down a great point. Here in lab and I'm not the guy anymore. Or, why would you want me to do something that was forced? It just doesn't make any sense. You know? And that's just it. I mean, the, the stuff that I get excited to make right now is my solo stuff. That's where I'm yeah. like really excited. And, and, and you can think, I think Don's the same way about sculpture. He's like really excited to do that. And that's, what's, that's, what's in our heart. And despite what people say about my solo stuff or sculpture or, or Jason's moonbladder stuff, it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, we're, we're artists. We're, we're going to do what we do and you're going to like it or you're not. You know, but it's yeah. it's us that has to live with it for the rest of our lives. We can't make an album that that was just purely to make hits or make you know or to make a label happy or to make a certain fan base happy. You you can't do that. We got our buddy uh, Marty stopped in here from heavy. I can never say the fucking word metallurgy. I have to do it really slow, otherwise I slur it and sound like I'm drunk. Heavy metal, Marty. Huh? I just said, what's up, Marty? Yeah, what's up, Marty? He says, you absolutely can't make an album for the fans. It will fail every time. I don't know about yeah. fail, but it's not going to come from a pure a, a pure place. It's not going to come yeah. from an inspirational place if you're trying to just replicate the same shit that you did 15, 12, 8, 9, 10, whatever. If you want to make Mantle 2. Look at Queensryche. They tried to oh. make Mind yeah. Crime 2, and it's a fucking abomination, right? Right. So, no. um... And, and yeah, and by the way, I don't know if you know who that is, John, but that's Marty that's from Marty. Metal Maniacs. Marty Richtonen, right? <laughs> yeah, Richtonen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so he's a good buddy of ours. Um, but yeah, man, I, I what? Tell us real quick then what's going on. I think you alluded to it. You're working on part three. Yeah, yeah. I'm just I'm working on basically the funeral album. <laughs> right. Okay. So it's 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 more it's more like the first album in that it's. It's more abstract, but the instrumentation is more based on like uh, harmoniums and violins, and it's it's more somber. It's I've been listening to a lot of like raison d'etre and oh. like dark dark wave stuff from the '90s that I love. Yeah, for inspiration. In addition to like the Morricone stuff, you know. Do you know stuff like uh, City's Last Broadcast? No. Um, Atrium Carceri, Carceri, Atrium Carceri. No, oh, dude, I got I got a lot of links to send you that I think you'll I think you'll thank me because I I I still love a lot of dark ambient like tri oh, yeah. trippy weird dark ambient that's got a lot of almost um, nightmarish sort of yeah psycho uh, psychedelic sort of shit going on and yeah. this is I, I I'm gonna turn you on to a couple cool projects because there's millions of things out there I mean and then there's like uh uh. De Boren Club, uh, what's it called? I can never. Oh, say. Yeah, Boren and their Club of Gore. Boren and their Club of Gore, which is like acid jazz, black acid jazz, yeah. and that's, that's always very cool. But it gets a little monotonous. It's kind of samey, but you got to find the good stuff. But um, if um, so you have two out now. I, I'm sorry, I don't remember. Have right? have two. Yeah, two, two. Uh, last place I remember and Cast Iron Blood, and then um, the new one that I'm working on, hopefully it'll get released early next year. Um, what do you have available physical on Bandcamp for those prior ones? CD? All the, CD. Uh, um, CD? So I, when I was in Germany in September, Nico and I struck up a deal to do for him to release the first three or well, the, the entire trilogy on vinyl. Okay. Um, but the stipulation is I have to finish the third one so he can have them all pressed at the same time. And then it'd it be like a money. like a book set, like a box set, or no? It won't be a box set, but we're definitely going to treat it as such when we when we submit it to the plant. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because you, you, you get a better rate that way. You're looking at a 2004 date. You think sometime in 2004? 2024. Yeah, hopefully. Um, maybe maybe middle of the year for that because I want to have the, the the CD version out first, and it takes a little bit more time to do vinyl, also. also so sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, so is it safe to say that are you kind of similar to Don that 
like do you keep a pulse much in the current metal scene or is that something no. that not at all yeah no i mean the only stuff i'm really familiar with is like what's on eisenwald yeah and a lot of that stuff i'm not even really interested in nothing against it it's just i don't not know yeah. And I really don't like these new productions. These mm. really super polished. Like they're really cool. pristine. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Like, I, okay. I listened to a newer Suffocation song a while ago and was just floored at just how sterile it sounded compared to like Effigy of the Forgotten. Yeah. Just, it wasn't brutal. It was just technical and just blah. Wow. And those like, drums, dude. The drums. Yeah. Oh, I cannot, you know. I love Terrence. Cool. I'm trying to get him on here shortly. Uh, I'm going to go see him next week, actually. When I um, love Old Suffocation, I still love that first album. It's amazing. Yeah. But those yeah. drums, man, I saw him open for Death to All, and I was just, you know, Gene's playing fucking real drums. He's the machine up there, right? He's the, the death yeah. clock, right? Um, or the atomic clock. And the guy for Suffocation was just clickety, clickety, clackety, clickety. And you're like, that triggered drum sound. I fucking hate that shit, man. Yeah. And it seems like that's all anybody uses in brutal music anymore. I mean, I'll tell you something, man. One of the coolest shows I've seen, and you'll I think you'll probably appreciate this, is in June I saw Yob mm -hmm. and they have a new drummer, Dave French. Um, and man, he even screwed up at one point and they had to start the song over. I was like, Yes, man, that's fucking live music right there. That is yeah. so yeah. I, I thought it was awesome that they fucked up and had to start the timing over. Because he was off on something, Mike screwed up. But I mean, you know, that's a band right there that it's just in your face, dynamic aggression that is just heavy as fucking plutonium, right? And they're all about tone. Oh, God, mm -hmm. Mike is those I mean, emperor, those emperor heads, and yeah, I mean, Yob was the band that Agalock opened for for our first show. So I mean, was it really? Yeah. Wow. When when was that? What year was 2003. that? Two thousand three. That's all going to get talked about in the mantle book. Okay. Cool. And there's actually on the bonus CD, I actually, there's a, there's a live track from that show included. Cause Sweet. it was recorded. There was a soundboard recording of that show. Are you friends with Mike? I mean, do you guys? Oh yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. Great guy. I've been chasing him to come on. He keeps avoiding me. I'm not sure what's up with that. <laughs> Maybe yeah, he just doesn't like, like me. I don't know. I'm... He's like a spiritual guru. <laughs> he is. And that's why I thought it would be a cool conversation that we could have about Everything other than we can talk metal, but we can get into all the esoteric shit, you know what yeah. I mean? Which is, you know, which is stuff I love kind of. Uh, Was that the Cambridge show, the uh, the track you're talking about? Mm, no, no, but that was on uh, Stone and Pillar. The okay. reissue of Stone and Pillar on CD. Yeah. That's there right. were some That's tracks right. from the Cambridge show in 2004. I just couldn't remember if that was the first show because I remember that that was like. You, you could find it was bootlegged like you know years ago it was like i remember like the days yeah. before you really played much live that was we cool. did a tour in two, 2003 also mm -hmm. um with antimatter and virgin black but we had played three shows with uh duncan patterson yeah, yeah. oh <laughs> I, spent, I love that fucking band i, I spent a, i spent a lot of time in a van with that dude <laughs> dude and you know what's weird he and i had a, an interview planned and then he ghosted me completely i don't he lives in Mexico now. He does. He's lived there for a while, actually. We used to talk. This will, re this will ring a bell to you. We used to talk quite frequently back in the uh, MySpace days, man. Um, him, Me and him and Mick Harris from uh, Napalm. Oh, yeah. We, we would talk about, because Mick had that fucking Scorn project. I love Scorn. Love, lol. He did love, lol too. And, and no, no, I love Mick, Scorn. I love Scorn, too, man. Yeah. Oh, that that is some fucked up shit, right? Um, but yeah, Duncan and I used to talk when he was in Antimatter, and then because my favorite Anathema albums are the Duncan Patterson era of, of everything, because I Me think too. he's just an amazing songwriter. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I was gonna have him on, and I don't know. I'm gonna try reaching out to him again. Maybe if he sees you're on, he'll he'll uh, he'll come on. And that's sometimes how I have to work things. It's like, hey, I talked to so and so, and you know uh, that I haven't talked to him in th in 20 years. So. Oh, really? That long? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was when we toured together. But dude, those <laughs> first well, actually the first five antimatter albums are mm -hmm. just Mick Moss. What a voice. Oh yeah. What a great songwriter, man. What an amazing I mean, I don't even know how to explain them. Kind of alternative rock slash dark ambient slash gothic kind of a little bit, you know? Yeah. When we toured with them, they had just put out lights out. 
Wait, which one was that? That was their second album. It's oh like yeah, blue. yeah, the black, the black one. It's black and blue with a chair. Yeah, on. yeah, yeah. And that's the real, <laughs> almost the Pesh Modian one that has a a much darker tone than the first kind one. Of. Yeah, I, I think you know them, Jimmy. Antimatter. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I mean, I know who they are. I, I never really checked it out. Oh, uh, yeah, you got to check them out. out stuff, but, Absolutely mm, incredible. I'll um, have to go back to it. We'll rip through a couple things. Does anybody have anything for John? Uh, we're going to keep him here two and a half hours. I feel bad about that, but hopefully you enjoyed the. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not like Don. I don't. I don't. You're, have you're a, cool for a little bit. Um, yeah, I'm fine. Does anybody have any actual questions? <laughs> yeah, there, Marty says hi, John. Good to see you doing well. We all feel that way. A lot of new production today, Rick. My boy, Rick, you're up late tonight, Rick. One thirty, bro. What the fuck? You know I don't have to get up tomorrow. I can sleep all day. I don't know about you. I'll explain that to you after, John. We'll, I'll explain to you why, if you're even interested. Um, a lot of new production today makes things sound way too synthetic. Yep. Yeah, and that is the great charm about Agalog. Everything's very – there's so much acoustic in the music, which I love. It's like that – you cannot – you can still be metal and be acoustic, man. You can do a lot of cool shit with the acoustic guitar and acoustic instruments and, and still be heavy and dark and foreboding. You don't necessarily have to be evil. You can just be menacing and, yeah. you know, that, that kind of like dark mm -hmm. void feeling of, but that's the thing about Agaloc. There is moments of that void feeling, but then there's a lot of moments of release and, and expansive beauty like the Morricone stuff and maybe some of the better moments of like Enslaved where you have that that grand epic sort of vibe, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, I just felt like there was a very cinematic vibe to it too. You know? Always. I mean, like I, I grew up in New Orleans and like when I first heard Pale Folklore, it was like one of those records that like kind of made me like yearn for like wilderness and even though I'd never even growing up in it we didn't really have anything like that down south except for swamps and you know maybe some odd forest here and there you know but it was kind of the imagery that you know kind of it evoked when you listen to the music yeah 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 we kind of just asked that um kind of jimmy kind of asked it a little bit earlier since you weren't hanging out all stream rick thanks a lot buddy um he's asking are you on the pulse with today's post where'd it go post black metal bands like fen Eve, feel like they in, they were influenced by you at all? Uh, well, Fen, we've we've toured with them. Um, we we go way back with Fen, all the way back to their first EP. And Frank's Frank's been a good friend of mine for a long time. In fact, when I was going through my dark period, he was very concerned about me. <laughs> no good. Um, yeah. So, um, and he he's actually quoted on the mantle in the mantle book. And yeah, no, he I, I love Fen. Did you say? I don't you know I apologize. Did you give an ETA on the book? Are we talking first quarter of 24 or? Hopefully, yeah, I'd say first quarter. Okay. If do I can get still, Do they still have any of the uh, stone, wind and pillar uh, left, Jimmy, uh, as far yeah. as it wasn't limited? It's not I limited. Mean, I mean, I think you, I, I, I know some of the colors were limited, but I mean, I. I I'm talking about the book, the, the media book. Oh, oh, the pale folklore book. Yeah. Pale, um, I'm sorry. I think there's still some. I mean, it hasn't been. I have to look into it. I have to look into it because I was in a place where I didn't have a lot of cash when that came out, and I need to. I'm uh, I'm flush right now, so I need to get that in the in the house. Um, and I think I think he's going to keep that in print for a while. Okay, that's yeah. cool. Uh, John, I had a real important question for you. Can't believe it's taken me this long to to do this. Who are your top guitar influences? Like. Who do you feel affected you the most as a young beginning guitar player and as you progress through to where you are now? Um, Alex Lifeson, number one. I'm sorry, who? Alex Lifeson, okay. number one. Uh, John, we are like we are like kindred <laughs> spirits, my friend. That's the uh, guy that made me pick up a guitar. Yeah, uh, and The Edge is another one. He's, he's the one that, I mean, I... Say what you will about you too, but I love those first five records. Dude, yeah. those first albums fucking rule, man. Yeah. Especially War. Even... Yeah. And the and Unforgettable and the Fire Eno. is a masterpiece. Oh, dude. Man. And yeah, those Brian Eno. Period. Fucking Period. great. Um, Boy. Boy's a masterpiece. Boy's I mean, great. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, what about I, um what about guys like um are you familiar with guys like Frank Marino? Now he's more of a blues guitar player, but are you familiar I, with I'm not like about him or Rick guy. Emmett from Triumph or No, I'm not much of a blues guy, actually. Not a Hendrix guy or a Page guy at all. I mean I respect them, but like a lot of my a lot of well, okay. Aside from like, you know, Slayer <laughs> and bands like Dissection and stuff like, you know, Over and all that stuff that I was like, you know, really influenced by. I'd have to say that like I was really into I've always really been into like post post-punk guitar playing mm -hmm. lots of like open notes and you hear it in my playing i mean it's mm -hmm, for sure it's yeah obvious. um so that's you know I, i'd say that but yeah alex lifeson definitely he his rush basically taught me how to play how to write songs well dude the f, sharp, the f the f sharp suspended f4 chord is the alex lifeson chord it's the yeah you know you let those bottom strings ring you've only played the top four and it's such an iconic I mean, talk to John Petrucci. He's like, dude, that's the fucking Alex Lifeson chord. Everybody knows that, right? Right. <laughs> Xanadu. It's full of those things. Jerry Cantrell ripped them off for tons of songs. So, I, yeah, you you and I could nerd out on Lifeson for probably two and a half hours. So we right. we should probably move on. But was there anyone in in that? Um, you talk about the open chordal stuff, like Daniel Ash from Love and Rockets or Bauhaus or or. Um, like, well, I mean, you know, I love the, I love the playing. I, I really like like old Christian death. And that was one of those bands that when I was a younger kid getting into music, I had a friend who lived in, in um, Lake Stevens, Washington, who was way into goth music. And he got me into Joy Division and Christian death and Killing Joke mm -hmm. and, and, and a very important band called Play Dead. And Play Dead had some really interesting techniques in there. Don't in, know them. Where, where are where, they from? I think the UK, I think. Okay. Um, I love Johnny Marr. I love his playing in the Smiths. Oh my God. So you know, good. You know, I, that, and that's the thing. I, I like, I like guitarists that have an interesting voice. They may, they may, may not be, you know, super technical or, and yeah, really, virtuos yeah, right. Virtuosos, but if they have, like, I feel that way about Don. I think that Don's playing, you can tell it's him. Yep. And that's the mark of a, of a great guitarist is you don't have to be able to shred, but if you can play in a style that it's just you, you sure. can tell. I think yeah. you'll agree with this statement. Shredding on Agalock would never work. It just would never. Well, I mean, on the demo, I wanted him to shred on those songs. <laughs> it just would not work for me. I, wa I, wanted, the, I wanted the Arcturus <laughs> leads. Oh, you did? Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, what about bands like Mission UK or mm. Chameleons? I Oh, dude! The, the, I just saw the Mission UK and the Chameleons. One of the yeah. best shows I've ever fucking seen. It Absolutely love them. A hundred people there, max. Um, Chameleons yep. were insane. Yeah, and another band that's they were local for a while, and they moved back to Chicago. There's this band called Soft Kill, and his guitar playing is very much in line with the stuff I like as well. Um, he's very influenced by old U2 and and Chameleons and those kind of bands. So, you know, and that's the thing is like you know I was always of course, you know, and then of course you go back and you know, like Iron Maiden. Oh. I like. I was a big Dark Tranquility fan, and the, the quintessential bands, right? I mean, they're you know, the ones that, yeah. you know, for all of us. I mean, like I said, I'm a little bit older than you guys, but but those are those are cornerstone bands. They are, you know, Priest, Maiden, right? The, the new wave of British heavy metal stuff, the Merciful Fates, the Running all Wild. That stuff. I mean, you know, a lot of people. I'm not the greatest king diamond lover it's taken me a long time to kind of <clears throat> accept the eccentricity and the vocal stylings mm -hmm. but man michael denner and um oh, yeah. sherman holy sure. fuck yeah, yeah. i mean just, merciful fate too i mean just so oh, good yeah. well that's that's yeah, yeah exactly that's where i'm going with that um and i guess mike weed's in the band now right yeah from hex and Haas. yeah 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 um a couple quick questions here and i'll get you out of here and i have one big one for you at the end uh, I want to know how John felt about playing drums on Apollo Zen. It was fun. Um, that that album was that album was literally recorded the like right after Pale Folklore. So I played drums in Pale Folklore, and it was my first time in a studio playing with a click, basically. So it was a little awkward for me. But with the the sculptured album, you're like, okay, so okay, the way that we did this, we would rehearse. Agaloc, and then basically as a band, as the three of us, and then we would 
like then we rehearse sculptured right after that <laughs> and i was like i was playing both and i was playing drums in both right and um but with sculpture don really wanted me to play with the click and i hadn't really gotten that used to playing with the click i did it on pale folklore I, I hadn't practiced it as much because I had so many more responsibilities in Agaloc, like playing guitar and vocals and all this stuff that I had to prepare, prepare, prepare for. Right. So the drums on Pale Folklore are probably a little weak because of that. However, on Apollo End, I had practiced with a click track version of the songs that Don had provided to me. And, it, and I, was, I was really able to kind of flex my technical muscle because as a drummer, my two biggest influences were Dave, Dave Lombardo and Neil Peart. So if I could mix those two things together into one, you know, package, that's kind of what I wanted to do for the sculptured album. And also those drums, not triggered, not edited. It was live to wow. tape in the studio. And, you know, yeah. So um, it was fun. It was fun to just, play on a record where I didn't, where that was my only responsibility. And that was the only thing I had to focus on. And I think the, I think it, it was a, my performance was stronger because of that. And then literally like I recorded the drum tracks and then I left for Finland for a month and then I came back and the album was done. Nice. <laughs> it, was, it was cool. I didn't even get the, I didn't have to sit around or see the, 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 them making the record really. I just put my contribution in and I left and I came back and was able to listen to it on the way back on the drive from Seattle to Portland. It was great. Hey, with your solo stuff, are you doing all that stuff at home or do you, are you going to a studio for drums or? Well, actually, okay. So there's one song on the new album that actually has drums. It's, it's, it harkens back to the, the cast iron blood style, the more sort of okay. cinematic rockish style. And I recorded the drums for that when I was in Germany at, at Marcus Stock's studio. Cause I was there for another reason, which I can't talk about right now, but while okay. I was there, I I recorded the drum tracks for that for that part of the of the album. Um, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you do everything else at home then. For this album, yes, I'm I'm gonna I, I've been using a lot of different people and and studios for this one. It's it's been a little bit more of a piecemeal process than like Cast Iron Blood. I just I went to Tad's studio, Tad Doyle's studio in Seattle, and I recorded the whole thing there. Um, mm -hmm. the first album was recorded in Agalock's old rehearsal room with just a bunch of mics and Daniel mentioned, okay. recording it. but this one, yeah, I've got, you know, it's like, I'm recording a part here. I'm recording a part here. This person's helping with this part. So it's, yeah, it's going to come. What do you use? Next. What do you use at home? Are you using logic or what are you using? using logic. Using? Yeah. Logic. Okay. Um, and just basically a laptop for the most part. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, you know, I have my, my pedal board, like hooked up to my computer and, Right. But I also want to record live amps too and blend that. So, so Can you yeah, do I'll, that at your place or do you go to no, the studio? No, I have to, I got to go to the studio for yeah. that. Okay. A <clears throat> um, couple more quickies here and then we'll get you out of here. John, have you seen some of Jarmusch's later films like Patterson and Only Lover Left Alive? Well, yeah, I've seen all of it. Um, okay. I, love, I actually with... like Patterson a lot. Um, he's, he's asking if any films <laughs> worth mentioning in the last three years that you're into. A hit of Jarmusch or just in general? Well, anything, I think, in general. Oh, God. <laughs> How much time do we have? <laughs> well, um, as long as you want to go, I'm cool. But I, I don't know about Jimmy if he's got a role suit. I saw, actually, I saw a really, a really interesting movie on the, on the flight back from Europe in September called The Menu. Have you seen that? Oh, my or, brother said that was really good. It's awesome. What was it called? The Menu. The menu. It's no, got I haven't. Isn't it? Uh-uh. Um, I don't know. I, you know, we have this amazing uh, movie rental store in Portland that called movie madness. Actually, Don was wearing a t-shirt of it and it's, oh, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, yeah. it's a, it's a movie rental place and they have everything. They've got okay. the weirdest back, you know, VHS, the weirdest sketchy shit you can find. Okay. <laughs> and gotcha. they have got every like silent film you can imagine. They've got just everything. And it's a museum too. They actually have a, it, they have a prop museum in there as well. And it's so I just go there and I'll just geek out. Yeah. Um, well, here's one for you. I'll make it easier. <clears throat> Are you a fan of horror at all? Old horror. I, although I do really like, I, one of the more modern horror films that I, I saw recently that I really liked was hereditary. Yeah, dude. 
Hereditary yeah. was fucking terrifying in the yeah. couple scenes at the end, man. I oh, was yeah. like, that's the one that got me. I didn't, I didn't really love Midsummer. I thought Midsummer dragged. Yeah, uh, I thought the uh, the lighthouse was cool, but it was. I love the lighthouse. I, love I, the I lighthouse. liked it, but it, uh, it got a little bit weird towards it. That one kind of dragged a little bit too, because he's really what's his name? Um, oh, what is Blind it? Dumbo. What is it? Robert the director Deere? or the? No, the dude that did um, the dude that did the lighthouse. Robert Eggers. Robert Eggers, yeah. yeah. Oh right, right. Um. Yeah, I liked it. I liked it. It just I, I don't know that I was completely blown away, but hereditary, fucking horrifying, man. I mean, oh, it was yeah. just terrifying. I was guess I was I'm not much on the modern horror anymore. No. I'm you know, I'm this guy, man. I mean, this shit, I love it. And and the hammer and the more, yeah. you know, the or the the stuff like um Diabolique or um yeah. you yeah. know uh, Eyes Without a Face, stuff like that. And we just did a really big a horror thing back on Saturday night, seven and a half hours worth, where we did a top 10, but it was more like a top 20. Do you have like a top five horror movies that you always go back to? Yes, I do. Uh, the shining. Amazing. Which I actually recently saw it in the theater. I went and saw it at the Baghdad. Amazing. Uh, yeah. Um, there's a German film called Der Totz King. Oh um, yeah, yeah. 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 That's one of my favorites. That's my, definitely my favorite. Your Bugarit film. Um, there's a film from 1981 called ghost story. That I absolutely loved when I was a, a kid, and I yes. still love it. I've not uh, seen that, and that was talked about a lot on Saturday yeah. night. Got to check that out. It's an amazing movie. And it was like the last roles for like Fred Astaire and Melvin. Yep. Uh, yeah. Anyway, great movie. Um, that's, I, mean, I have to think. Uh, what about the Changeling? I like the Changeling. Um, One of my yeah. faves. It's you know I really I'm more drawn to ghost story movies mm -hmm. and i am like gore or or slasher or anything yeah yeah same here yeah um i'm trying to think of a fifth one <laughs> i mean i could put hereditary on the list i could put the witch on the list uh, i didn't see the witch is it pretty good you know it is it, it's it's a little it, it's kind of churchy <laughs> I, oh, really? I saw it again and it's just like it's the it's like with these with these people stop being so fucking religious and just get <laughs> you know what this yeah. happened already yeah, yeah, but yeah. no, um, I, yeah, uh, I wish you would have asked me this, like, so I could prepare. <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not, I don't have my, that's uh, my, all right. that's okay, my DVD um, collection is in the other room. So I, yeah, yeah, that's fine. My buddy, Eric, the Canuck, the young Canuck from way <laughs> up North in British Columbia. We've done some cool stuff together. This kid, great, great young man. Uh, he's saying growing up in the wilderness of British Columbia, a lot of Agalox music really evokes the forest and mountains to me. Yep. For sure. I, I, I can see that my my dad was was born in in Vancouver, BC. So I spent a lot of time up there as a kid. Rick, I'm not sure what you're listening to, but I've never heard dissonance in Edge's playing. I hear the way he plays off echo is more the way he uses reverbs and echoes and delay is more his kind of thing. Um, Alex made Eric pick up. Yeah, I think Alex made a lot of people uh, I, pick up the guitar. I got I got a fifth one. Okay. Fifth movie. Begotten. Masterpiece. Wait, which one is that one? Um, it was nineteen ninety one, black and white. Uh what's his Who's name? Marehidge. Marehidge is the director. Um Who's in it? A bunch of nobodies. <laughs> Forgotten. It's called Forgotten. Oh no, Begotten. Oh, Begotten. Okay. Yeah. All right. I gotta check that out. That's, that's another one, one of my all time favorite movies. All right, that's a new one to me. I'm definitely checking that. Ghost know. Story was already on the list for sure. It's, um, it's very experimental. It's very abstract. The whole thing was done on like 16 millimeter. Okay. Oh, I'd like that then. Cause I'm always, yeah. do you know, um, I'm sure you do. Do you know, uh, the strange cabinet of Dr. Caligari? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, that, the, I'm telling you that movie is so fucking eerie weird. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and again, like another one, vampire. Oh from, yeah. Um, like Carl Dreyer, yes, yes. Oh, Dreyer, man. I mean, the only weird part of that movie, and I think you know which part I'm talking about, is mm -hmm. when the weird dude is like, they get the weird, wow, wow, the weird, strange fucking chicken noise in there. It's odd, but that movie is so evocative of creepiness without ever being scary. It just, it kind of creeps you out, right? Um, I love okay. like those. I love those old silent films from the twenties and stuff like uh, the Phantom Carriage is a yes, movie. yes, amazing, amazing, yeah. amazing. Um, Tyler says I noticed a drinking horn 
the Othala rune in the book for the mantle, the Raven skull. Are you into practicing paganism, even if it's just nature worship like me? I'm more of a pantheist. I'm, I, I mean, I used to be more involved with like the Satru people, but it kind of got sketchy after a while. And some of their associations kind of bit me in the ass later on. So, <laughs> uh, who are we well, talking about? I'm sorry. Oh, uh, just the whole Asatru um, assembly folk. Um, well, actually, that's a great that's a great question. Right, yeah. That brings up a great question. It might be it's a touchy one because everybody tiptoes around it. What are your what are your perceptions or feelings on bands that are sketchy? I.e., you know, Satanic War Master or uh, bands like Argus Lint or, you know, things like Jimmy, help me out. Even Magua, who has this, they've come out very hard against no, or DSO. DSO is a good one, right? I mean, that, you know, very, very pioneering sound, but you've got this character, Miko, that's got a lot of fucking baggage about what the hell he stands for. And who, what, what, do you want to talk about that? Or would you rather avoid that one? I mean, I'll talk about it. I just, I think a lot of people misunderstand what I have to say. I think if the music's quality, it's pe people have to make their own decisions what they want to listen to. Um, you know, I'm not going to sit sit here and say, "Oh, you shouldn't listen to Graveland." You know, it's like if the if if the if the music's good and if you like it, then fine. Um, if if you're listening to it because you like the racist element, then that's not so cool, right? <laughs> but and that's and I kind of feel that way about Argos Lent and Grambelow's Key and you yeah. know. All those bands. It's like I have the original Grand Belial's Key demo back before they turned into that kind of band. They were more of just a satanic black metal band. How about Varg? I mean, he's always such a polarizing figure. Do you have a stance on that as far as – because I'll be honest with you. I, I, knew I think he's Varg. a very talented moron. What's that? I think he's a very talented moron. You know, the thing is for me, John, I'm going to be Basically. blunt with you, though. I The first Varg album, while I get the whole – ambience thing i never got the vocals i always just kind of was like this is kind of really bad <laughs> you know i you know you can say the same thing about dissection you can say the same thing about emperor you sure. know they had sketchy shit i mean i mean even even if you really want to play that game you you could you can connect the dots from over all the way to burzum because they're the drummer on Bergtop played when played in burzum for a little while yeah, you know, he's not on any records or anything, but you know, it's just like it's I don't know. I think if people just need to make their own own decisions yeah. and not be so like dogmatic about it, if you know well, there is a bit of wokeism and yeah. triggerism, but I mean for me personally, I, I just don't really pursue it very much. But and I'll give you a, a great example of it is love the somber lane, I love Storm of the Lights Bane. I'm not a great big fan of John Notvite. He made a bad decision, you yeah. know, and, and, you know, he, he went down a bad path. Yeah. You know, I, I, I can't, I never, I never met him. Um, there was a yeah. chance where there was talk of Agaloc and dissection touring in 2006 wow. together. And I was totally fine with it, but he obviously couldn't get into the States. Yeah. I would have liked to have met him to see what he was about, but you know, I just think he was, he was misguided and went down a bad path. I mean, no I did it. Yeah. I, I've, I've kind of went down a bad, bad path for a little while too. And, you know, but you, you, you have to, you find your way out of it. And, yeah, yeah. you know, it's a here. Um, that's how Don, I feel about Don as a guitarist. Yeah. He's a great guitar player, man. No doubt. Uh, John is as well. John's setting up us up for a surprise Ingve guest appearance on the next solo. I'm kind of doubt that, but no, you know, Don, Don's more of the Ingve guy. Yeah. Running wild. I, don't know I love running that. wild. Fucking Those love first them. couple albums are killer, man. Um, all the way up to, uh, fuck, man, the revel, the rivalry probably is like everything from the first album to then. To we, to uh, a some, to a certain degree, I actually like them more than Iron Maiden. Wait, Running Wild, yeah, yeah. Good, well, Don and I have argued tooth and nail against. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Tooth and nail, <laughs> a sly little Dokken reference there. I um, don't like Dokken. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> Come on, man. I tried when I was young, when I was first getting into metal to get into docking. And you I gotta like, understand, I got 10 years on you, man. I, I do <laughs> love George Lynch. Love George Lynch. He's a great um, player. Yeah. Glad to hear a bit of Apollo Ends on John's end. Cool. Jeff, if you what? All right. Uh, hang on. 
If you move your head over the edge, it will look like you're playing Don's guitar. How cool would that be? Oh, you do, yeah. You mean like this, like I'm doing this. Yeah. Yes, it is me. Uh, let's see what else. John, should Agalock indeed create new music? Do you foresee going back to just the three of you again in the studio, meaning you back on drums? That's a good question. Probably not. I haven't played drums seriously since 2006, so I would need to buy a drum set and get my chops back up. And, and honestly, if we have Hunter, why the hell would I do Why that? bother, right? Yeah. Just let him do it, right? And also, the reason why I stopped playing drums is because I wanted to spread out the responsibilities. I felt yeah. that it was weakening my performance on all fronts. Yeah, too much going on, right? Yeah, I mean, the mantle was the mantle was better, but we also did it. Use, we used a click track with the mantle, and it was a little bit better. Still, once again, nothing was edited on that album. It was all one take, basically. So... Um. Okay, uh, I I wanted to ask you about this album because this is for Marty's uh, Marty's edification here because I'm curious to see what John says if he says what I think he might say about this and I'm I could be very wrong uh, then I will be the king of of everything because I I just know but uh, what are you what is your opinion of this album, sir? Uh, it's been a long time since I heard it. I know Don's a big fan. I, I liked it. And you know, I like it as a casual listen. I'm not. I, I not not a, not, a, not a massive diehard. No. All uh, right. Well, then I like. I, I show me show me the Comus record, and I and I'll. Oh, I, I have first stuff. utterance. I've, I, yeah, I have first show utterance. me that. I'm more in that. Super actually. weird fucking yeah. album. I love it, but it's so Roger Wooten's vo vocals are just so weird. You know. Right. And of course, we all learned about that probably from Michael. I would assume. I did, anyways. From uh, yeah. from Opeth. Um, all right, man. How about Jimmy? What do you got? Well, this is a stupid question, but I asked Don, so I'm gonna have to ask you. It's stupid but fun. Uh, if Bigfoot was real, what would his favorite Agalock record be? <laughs> Wait, Big, Bigfoot's not real. <laughs> Bigfoot? Didn't they just find like a sighting of him on a hill yeah. somewhere from a train or something? Did you oh, guys it was see definitely that? him for sure? Probably Marrow the Spirit. Oh, wow. So that's what yeah. Don said, too. Yeah. <laughs> Did he really? Yeah. You remember that? I didn't remember that. I would have thought it would have been Pale Folklore, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. Maybe Pale Folklore, but I don't know. I just... There's some... Maybe the rawness of Marrow the Spirit would probably feel that's more... That's kind of what... Yeah, Don kind of said yeah. similar. He said, like, uh, just because it's a little bit more of a ferocious record, maybe. It was and just, it's creepy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. John, I do all my thumbnails, right? And the one thing I was thinking, once I found out you were joining us, I'm like... Man, John's gonna be judging my thumbnail game. It's like I gotta come up with something that looks cool. And I hit up Don with it. I said, "Are you cool with this? Is it too much aquamarine?" <laughs> He's like, "I'm cool with it. I don't know." But I mean, do you do much on? I imagine. What do you do? Like, like with regards to? Are you Photoshop guy? What do you? Oh, I'm. Yeah, I'm. I'm Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign. You know. Lightroom. Did you go to school for that? Is that what you went yeah. to school for? Yeah, okay. that's what I went to school for, yeah. So, so graphic arts then. Yeah. yeah. I got a bachelor's in it. So yeah. What's your um what's your favorite old school death metal bands? Like if you had to pick a top five from that era, the the er, you know, the eighties into the early nineties, where are you going? Every time. Uh Entombed, first two albums. Um, Dismember. All the albums. Okay. Um, uh, I love the first Suffocation album. Uh, I, I actually really like the first Cannibal Corpse album. I, I think actually, I, no, actually, I I like all of their stuff. I mean, they're they're one of those bands that's they're like ACDC. They're just they're so terrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They have four uh, songs. They do really well. Yeah, I mean, you know, and you pick so, up any of those Dismember reissues that just came out. They just reissued like the entire catalog on vinyl. I saw that. I haven't picked those up. Um, I really love the Iron Crosses record a lot. Oh, I yeah. thought that was probably mm -hmm. the best one since the first album. When it comes to, to this member, I, I'm actually got the rather controversial stance that I don't like Indecent and Obscene that much. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Man. But I love the first album and I love the Iron Crosses album. And But yeah, I mean... They're they're one of those solid bands like Cannibal Corpse where they can't do any wrong. Other other than uh, Cannibal, is there, uh, you know, to stay in the Floridian sort of Mora sound era? Oh. Are there bands that are they all yeah. kind of 
in your, I mean, your retinue or no? Yeah. I mean, I love like, like Alters of Madness is one of my favorite albums of all time. The first couple of Carcass records, of course, I love that stuff still to this day. Actually, I'd say the first three. What about stuff like Cynic and Atheist? Is that too techy for you? I love the first two Atheist albums, and I like the Cynic demos, which I got when they came out. Which are the, was, are the yeah, the the death metal stuff before yeah, they went was, into the vocorder, right? Yeah, I mean, I was a little, I was kind of out of it out of that 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 realm when they put out focus and you know bands like like pestilence had put out spe- spheres and i i just i didn't like i didn't like the later death stuff that was like that oh really like from where human on or what no i think individual thought patterns was the last album that was where they lost me okay um, got a little bit too yeah. too progressive yeah one of my absolute although speaking of atheist one of my absolute probably top three favorite death metal albums of all time and will always be until I, the day I die is North from here from sentenced. Oh, that, yeah. And that's super gothy though. That's the one that's very, no, 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 no. That's, that's like at the gates, but better. <laughs> Wait, are we talking about the first one or the the second album? Oh, the second one. Okay. That's I'm a little, I'm a little lean on sentenced uh, vibes. I know the first one in the, can't, the one that got real gothy. I forget Amok. what it What was it called? A mock? No, it was like the fourth or fifth one. Blue oh, blue cover on it, I think, was Marty will know. He he's a big yeah. sentence guy. Um I re- I mean, so it's basically the period of sentence that I really like was the, the Tonnelly period where he was the vocalist. Which is kind of funny because he's become a friend of mine. <laughs> oh nice. But he's a he's a, here's the funny thing about Tonnelly. So I, I, last time I was in Finland, I was hanging out at his flat and we we're drinking. And I, you know, he, he flat out said, he's like, you know what? I just, I don't like the Agalock stuff. I don't like the Pelorian stuff, but cast iron blood. That's like the best thing that you've done. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> yeah. He loves my solo stuff. He wants to play shows with me. Cause he's got a new, he's got a new project called uh, the dark place, like Tonali J- Yadava in the dark place. Okay. And it's, it's like total, like kind of, like swans dark like leonard cohen and early and, and the acoustic oh swans. wow really scott Walker, weird yeah yeah with it yeah. with that voice and it's uh-huh. awesome he wants to play some shows i'm just like well okay next time i'm in finland sure <laughs> well actually that's an interesting prospect do you have anything solo coming up or planned or uh shows yeah no no, no? Not, not until probably next year i'm working on the next album right now okay and just focused on that um, I had one more thing for you. Uh, oh, it's funny. Somebody's asking about mortician. I, I posted a photo when I was 16 years old on my Instagram story a few days, a few days ago. And I was wearing a mortician shirt that I actually bought from Will Romer in 1990. Oh shit. Um, cause I bought, I, one of the first thing, first demos I ever bought when I discovered the underground was the mortician 1990 demo and the shirt. And, um, yeah. And I got it from Will himself. And what's, there's a funny story about that is like, I didn't, you know, I was six. No, I was, early, I was like 15. So I didn't know how checks worked. <laughs> ah. And so, you know, I, I, I got a money order and I filled it out to mortician. No way. <laughs> and I sent it off <laughs> and I get this letter a couple of weeks later from, from Will saying, Hey kid, I can't, I can't cash this. <laughs> Oh shit! No way. You have to write it out to Will Romer. <laughs> oh, you made it out to Mortician the band. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So. What year was this? That was 90, 1990. 90. Yeah. Oh, that's fucking hilarious, dude. That's so. And I, nice. I actually liked in Pentigo too. Oh, you that, do like you like some of that more that old stuff? Yeah, that gritty, grindy stuff. Yeah. Um, gotta ask you this, man. This is a very important question, John. Our relationship going forward depends upon it. Favorite Rush album, hands down, no bones. Oh, that's tough because they're all. It's like saying, "What? Who's your favorite child?" Right. Um, it's impossible to pick. I can I contend that from Fly By Night through Power Windows, there's a, it's very hard to find a eight album sequence like that that is that solid soup to nuts 
and that's well, where my, my favorites in that group, of course. All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna answer your question, and I'm gonna do it honestly, and it's gonna disappoint the living shit out of you. It is Presto. Oh man. Okay. <laughs> really. I, here's the thing about that album. For a long time, I kinda didn't like it, but dude, there's some killer songs on there, like Presto. Dude, the house um, second half of that record is amazing. I love Chain Lightning. I love uh, Available Light. Yeah, uh, that song's killer, man. That song's killer. It's one of those ones that kind of grew. And and it's funny because Jimmy and I did a deep dive on Rush back. It was one of the second things we did. And Jimmy's, like, entry point, because he's younger, was Hold Your Fire, right, Jimmy? No, my no moving pictures. But Hold my hold Your Fire was in my top five, though. In fact, it was like, I, think I, I think I had it as number two. And for, for the, the longest record. time, that album, for most Rush fans, kind of – sits near the bottom but me it's kind of in the upper middle tier yeah um i think it's a fantastic song album little the production's a little bit too really thin yeah it's thin and very way too modern for its own good but um if you had to guess what do you think my favorite album is hemispheres of course <laughs> was, that, was that, that obvious people your age in your age group, they tend to, you know, if they're Rush fans, that's probably the, yeah, it's either that or twenty one twelve. I think John's trying to say I'm an old fuck. I think that's no, what no. It's just I'm just saying. <laughs> I, I got I, a parallel to Kings over all, all through those. Two. It could be, it could be any on any given day. Those two flip flop, but yeah. So a little quick story on me, John, uh, because I am, like I said, I'm born in sixty six. So my second concert, my first concert was Kiss, because Kiss was my gateway band into everything. Heavy. It was at mo most guys my age. Marty, you know, it's what we knew, right? And I still like those early Kiss albums up through Love Gun, let's say. Yeah. But stuff. my first Rush album was, in fact, Hemispheres. And I bought it simply because there was a dude in eighth grade. I was in seventh. There was a dude in eighth grade named Steve, but we always called him Flake because he was always stoned, right? This is, keep in mind, this is 1978. You know, this dude's in seventh grade. I'm in, or I'm in seventh. He's in eighth. I see him come in with the original Starman baseball jersey, white, black, the Starman with the orange kind of burnt orange sort of look, you know. And I'm like, that is the coolest shirt I've ever seen. As fate would have it, my mom takes me out to the Greens Point Mall in, in Houston that night or the next day or that weekend. And I see Hemisphere sitting up in like Foley's department store. I don't even, I don't think they're even around anymore, but. It's sitting there on the, 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 the thing, and I'm like, that's the band. That's the band I saw on that guy's shirt. And I wanted to be like Flake, except for I didn't smoke weed, and you know I wasn't as, as weird as him probably. Bought that album, and that was it, man. That was it. That's, that cemented that moment. Kiss went away. Rush became the thing, and Rush was the second band I ever saw in 1980 for the Permanent Waves tour. Wow. And then I've seen them about 56 times since then up through the last Neil before, you know, 2015 for the 40th anniversary. And I'll tell you, man, they rarely, rarely, rarely ever disappoint, but my least favorite would be test for echo. I struggle with that. Um, there's a lot of really, yeah, there's some great songs on it, but there's some kind of ass songs on it. Roll the bones too, is kind of a 50, 50. Well, here's the thing. Okay. So much like your story, my, my gateway to rush was roll the bones. Because, was it really? Yeah, because I it was in I think it was September of ninety one or September or October of ninety one. I was in a music store in Helena, Montana, with my friend Aaron, and you know I, I was shopping and they were playing the song "Roll the Bones," you know, in the store, and I didn't know who it was, and I think I ended up buying like "Effigy of the Forgotten" nah. <laughs> or, yeah. or, or or Carcass's "Necroticism" or something. But then I, I asked the person, I was like, "Who is this?" And she's like, "Oh, it's the new Rush," and I was like, "Huh." So later on, I ended up buying it because that song just kept coming back to me, that chorus. And for, for uh, Roll the Bones, the song Roll the Bones, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, man, that that album, I love that. That's probably my second favorite Rush album because well, Bravado, Bravado's Bravado. one of the best songs ever, oh. right? And yeah. then Ghost of a Chance, some of Alex's best playing solo wise ever, so evocative. But there's a lot of I think you're like, yeah, stone. I'm not really into carve away the stone and it's kind of a 50 50 i wish they'd get rid of the jack relax bit and all that shit like that so um 
But um, I think Jimmy's got a roll. We'll we'll stroll through the comments quick. Get John out of here. Okay. A mock is the album Jeff is thinking of. Okay, maybe it is. I don't. Hey, you guys can hang as long as you want. I, mean, I, I just got to jump. I, I got to get on soon too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. First three sentences. Um, ribs. Marty, you need to check out Sensei. All right. Now nah, Marty knows all about fucking sentence man he's just oh, that's one of his oh, favorites yeah. he's yeah. twisting uh P- yeah oh, yeah tonally loves filter nephilim too i mean who does and i tonally the singer on that on that album he he loves fills and nephilim too he we've nerded out <laughs> in a drunken <laughs> night talking about that stuff yeah caress of steel way underrated album man way yeah. underrated i love first, that fucking album i actually prefer it over 2112 it's not as old as me. You're correct. It's like uh, I was like 10 when that album came out. Thanks, uh, Tyler. Thanks for reminding me. Um, all right. I think we're going to call it because uh, these guys got to get the hell out of here. Moving pictures or get the fuck out of here. No, Marty, you're just wrong. You're, just, <laughs> you're wrong. Classic. Trust me, Marty. I got a few years on you when it comes to Rush. You got me on a lot of stuff, but this is one you don't have me on. Snakes and um, Arrows, though. They brought it back with Snakes and Arrows. Getty. Well, Getty. Oh, yeah. Getty's not, they didn't do the keyboard thing the last couple of albums, man. And actually, talk about the keyboard albums, man. Fucking Power Windows is super oh, heavy on the key. Oh, but it is an amazing album. It sounds so good on vinyl, too. Oh, it's crushing. Power Windows. No, see now here. See, you just showed what a poser you are, dude. You're not a Rush fan. You just, <laughs> you don't get it. Um, oh, Grace right. is great, too. What's that? Grace, Grace is fucking yeah. killer song yeah. on that tour. Grace. All right, we're going to wrap up. Um. I think that's going to be it. John, man, I cannot thank you enough for doing this, man. It's super cool. Uh, I want you to hang out for a minute. I'm going to wrap, and then I want to talk for a sec and, and then get you out of here, get some contact information going. And uh, everybody tuned in tonight. We had 20-some people on. We got 16 on at 2 a.m. on the East Coast, and I know some of you guys are East Coasters like me. So everybody thank John for being here, especially Don for getting it set up. We appreciate it. We miss Jason, but – I got some health stuff going on that made me think I better do it sooner rather than later. So maybe we can get you guys back in. If you do something coming up in the you know next year, we bring you all back on and, and kind of, kind of go for it. You know, I didn't ask you about fates warning. Are you a fates warning fan? Yes. I like, well, okay. I like awaken the guardian through like, I don't know, parallels, I guess. Yeah. Only I, about my, favorite is, my favorite is no exit actually. Which one? No Exit is my favorite. That's their most thrashy album. That's probably yeah. the heaviest album. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but um, all right, guys. Thank you, everybody. Um, I think uh, I think we're gonna move from here, um, and uh, we'll see y'all. I, the only one quick thing I wanted to run it uh, by you guys is I'm probably gonna dip for a little while because I got some medical shit I've got to deal with that I've been avoiding like the plague, and it's not gonna go well. So if I disappear for a while, you know why. Um, but hopefully next, let's say a week or 10 days from now, uh, I should be having Derek Vela and, um, possibly Phantom Slaughter from Worm. I'm not sure, but if not, Derek and Justin from Dream Unending are going to come on. I've got the, a bunch of the guys from Horrendous are going to be coming on. Hannes Grossman is going to be coming on. You should know him from Alkaloid and Hate Eternal and a whole bunch of other stuff. Great great stuff that's coming these are being set up dependent on what's going on with my the outcome of my test so everybody stay cool everybody if you can and you're in the denver area or close go out and support agalock check out the links in the description for john's solo stuff buy that stuff support this guy support the band he sent a new uh a reissue of Eisenwald reissue new book, reissues, media yep. things. What's that? Yeah, new reissues. Yep. New reissues coming of the Mantle and and Ashes. Ashes. Well, actually, all five. All five albums are will eventually have that treatment. Yeah. Okay. So there you go, man. Awesome. So really, really cool stuff. Appreciate y'all being here. Peace out.